If it's working, we can get started. Yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, let's get started. Let's remove this thing also. Okay. Oh, we already had lecture 20. That's amazing. I think we'll have two or three lectures and the final exam and we'll be done, right? Okay. Well, today we're going to cover cache coherence. Uh, this is an exciting topic for me because I couldn't lecture about this last year. We had to play a year, a video from the previous year. So now it's always good to lecture about it uh, after some time. And I think this, uh, I mean, certainly interesting because scalability issues affect both memory ordering as well as uh, cache coherence. And if you really want like highly scalable multiprocessors, these, these issues really bottleneck you in the end. And next week, we're going to talk about interconnects, which are actually very tightly coupled with the two issues that we discussed, uh, memory ordering. Well, the second issue is cache coherence, which you will discuss today. How many of you have seen cache coherence before in parallel programming classes? Which class? Say it again. I can... Oh, it's a little melody, man. Computer architecture? Somewhat. OK, somewhat. What about anybody else? Systems programming. OK, do you go into the hardware implementation? Yeah, probably you see it at a higher level, right? What, what the programmer should expect or what should happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, today we'll see hardware implementations. And you will implement in the lab five also if you choose to do it. And I'd recommend you do it because it's quite instructive. And you also get quite a lot of free credit, right? Let's say if you do it. Well, free is probably not the right word for it, but extra credit, let's say. So if you do everything in the class, you get 100 plus 12.5 points. And that 12.5 is pretty big uh, for the lab. Okay, uh, I think before jumping into cache coherence, I want to remind you of memory consistency and weak memory ordering in particular. And remember this slide we had somewhere yes, uh, some, uh, in the middle of the lecture yesterday somewhere. And we said that there are two performance enhancement techniques that make sequential consistency implementation difficult. Well, there are at least two, but out of order execution is one of them because it makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations, unless you do something else on top of it, right? Because processors send memory requests in the order that they send them. Uh, uh, and this, this order uh, is dynamic, right? And caching also makes it difficult because it prevents the effect of a store to be seen by other processors, right? If you actually are doing caching nicely. And we will see another issue with caching today that's different from this one. So caches actually cause a lot of problems in systems uh, with multiprocessors. Okay, recall that we were talking about weaker memory consistency. And in the end, I think we, we should probably just try to discuss if we have time, how do you merge consistency and coherence together? These are completely orthogonal concepts, but in the end, you need to support some consistency model and some coherence model. And the question is, how do you support both at low hardware cost? And then how do you scale it to tens of thousands of nodes? Both have similar issues. How do you support their implementation? And how do you scale them? If you want to build a scalable multiprocessor, you have to handle both. And weaker memory consistency, recall that uh, the realization is that you don't need to synchronize. Basically, you don't need to worry about the ordering of operations for every operation. What really matters is whenever you're synchronizing, the operations that require you to synchronize or that enable to synchronize. And the idea in weak consistency in general is programmers specifies regions in which the memory operations do not need to be reordered. And you can use memory fence instructions to delineate those regions, for example. And all memory instructions before the fence must complete before the fence is executed. All memory operations after the fence must wait for the fence to complete and fence is completed in program order. And all synchronization operations act like a fence. So this is one, this is one version of weak consistency. It's not the weakest model, basically, as we have discussed also. I will go through this a little bit more. So if you look at this, this is what we have kind of discussed. This is the weak consistency model. Uh, you can think of this as synchronization operation, acquire lock, release the lock, and then acquire another lock, release another lock. Basically each of these act like fences. You can put memory fences when you do those, but uh, in between the fences, uh, the ordering is not important because if you correctly synchronize your program, it doesn't matter what you do in terms of ordering over here because these operations are not going to be 
uh, acting on shared data or shared locks. What really matters is the synchronization operations. So if you read this beautiful paper that I recommend, it says a more relaxed consistency model can be derived by relating memory request ordering to synchronization points in the program. The weak consistency model, WC is not the greatest acronym, I guess, in this case, but anyway, it sounds like fun. <laughs> uh, I, I called some of my acronym, uh, um, my, uh, my own papers like par BS. BS doesn't sound like the best acronym also, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, WC proposed by Dubois et al. Uh, is uh, based on the above idea and guarantees a consistent view of memory only at synchronization points. And that's a nice idea, clearly. This was proposed in 1986. And you can see that I highlighted these two things over here. Under sequential consistency, every access within the critical section is delayed until the previous access completes. So if you look at this critical section, if you're sequentially consistent, you have a very strict ordering requirement. Every load is dependent on every store, and every load is dependent on every load. Well, dependent is the wrong word. But basically, you have to order every single memory operation. Right? But such delays are unnecessary if the programmer has already made sure that no other process can rely on the data structure to be consistent until the critical section is exited. And this is really the key, basically. If the programmer ensured correct synchronization over here, these delays, you don't need to order these operations. What you really need to order is what the programmer needs to ensure correct synchronization, right? Which is really the acquire and release operations over here, as you can see. Basically, they, it continues saying that weak consistency exploit this, exploits this by allowing accesses within the critical section to be pipelined meaning you can reorder them in some way. And correctness is achieved by guaranteeing that all previous accesses are performed before entering or exiting each critical section. So I think this is beautifully explained and you can see the ordering requirements here. Now you can say uh, this paper questions that assumption also saying that, well, not this paper, but another paper that was written by this author questions the assumption saying that, oh, do you really need to wait for this release to complete? Uh, basically, does this release uh, impose an ordering requirement on the block that comes after it? And the answer is no, right? This release has nothing to do with the block that comes after it, in essence, because it's not protecting that block. That block is outside the critical section. It's non-critical section. And assuming that program is correctly synchronized again, this should really, this can be ordered uh, together with this one. And that's what acquire release consistency model says, basically. Basically, uh, let me go to the next page. Well, this was the Dubois paper that I mentioned earlier that introduced the weak consistency. And this is the release consistency. I'll, I'll probably read it from here because it's beautifully written. Release consistency is an extension of weak consistency that exploits further information about synchronization by classifying them into acquire and release accesses. An acquire synchronization access, for example, a lock operation or a process spinning for a flag to be set is performed to gain access to a set of shared locations. A release synchronization access, for example, an unlock operation or a process setting a flag, grants this permission. An acquire is accomplished by reading a shared location until an appropriate value is read. Thus, an acquire is always associated with a read synchronization access. Similarly, a release is always associated with a write synchronization access. In contrast to weak consistency, release consistency does not require accesses following a release to be delayed for the release to complete. That's what I said basically, right? These accesses, release is not. Uh, operating as a synchronization operation on the accesses that come after it, basically. There's no relationship. These are not even shared data if you correctly synchronize your program. So the purpose of the release is to signal that previous accesses are complete, uh, and it does not have anything to say about the ordering of the accesses following it. And that's the key realization here. And similarly, a release consistent does not require an acquire to be delayed for its previous accesses. So you can see that over here. Uh, this acquire B, basically you need to or only order acquires as you can see and releases after the operations, after the critical sections. So this, uh, this acquire has nothing to do with prior operations before it. So there, there, uh, you, can, you can actually, you don't need to impose any ordering requirements between this acquire and this, and even this release and this, assuming you correctly synchronized again, that means that you just need to impose ordering requirements between these two acquires and then follow the arrows to do the ordering requirements. Does that make sense? Basically, only when you are actually synchronizing, when you really are protecting the data, you need to impose ordering requirements. Okay, hopefully this is clear. 
And you can see that now ordering requirements reduce significantly to acquires and releases. So fences, in, a, in other words, you need to be careful about the word fence right now, right? Because what is a fence? Because uh, you cannot just put a fence over here and wait because ordering requirements actually have changed a bit. Maybe you need to have some additional ordering operations that are inserted by the compiler uh, and not just uh, have fences where it releases and acquires are there. Okay, any questions? Yes. Uh, if A and B are two different locks, uh -huh. how come the, the requires have to be sort of following each other? Can't they just be acquired at the, in an arbitrary order? If yeah, potentially, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, but I think the uh, the difficulty, uh, yeah, now you're actually trying to make it even more relaxed, right? <laughs> okay, so it's just it's just as part of this sort of consistency model. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I yeah. think I think you, the the issue you may run into is when you get into nested locks, for example, when when you do nesting. I haven't thought about it enough at this point, but when you do nesting, you need to be very careful about the ordering requirements, for sure. When you're not nested potentially, but I think uh, in the end, uh, yeah. I mean, potentially you can, you can actually uh, do that also, right? Reorder them also potentially, but now you're also violating the program ordering potentially. That's the, uh, the, there might be some higher level semantics, right? In the program that may require these acquire and releases to be done in that order, right? That we don't know. But I guess if we wanted a strict order, we'd acquire the same lock, right? That's true, yes, that's true. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I guess it's just this model does it that way. Exactly, this okay. model doesn't have that basically, yeah. Okay, any other questions or thoughts along these lines? Okay, and this is the paper that introduced the acquire release consistency. That's a, it's also a very well written paper. I would recommend that. Okay, we talked about this, basically weaker consistency. There's no need to guarantee a very strict order of memory operations. And it enables the hardware implementation of performance enhancement techniques to be simpler, basically. Because now you're not, uh, you can do out of order execution, for example, freely, right? Without checking in portions of the program, especially that don't require the ordering, right? Whereas in sequential consistency, you need to just check uh, every operation. And again, it can be higher performance and stricter ordering. The disadvantage, of course, is there's more burden on the program. Remember what we said, the synchronization needs to be correct. Okay, let's assume that even synchronization is correct. Uh, then the program needs to label everything. That's fine. Uh, this, uh, this is one thing that I didn't mention yesterday, but debugging is also harder, unfortunately, especially if you have a buggy program. Now, if you have a buggy program, it's, it's become much more difficult to reason about what went wrong if, if your order is now all over the place, let's say. It becomes more like a, I, I don't want to say it exactly like a data flow processor, but it's, it's kind of like a data flow processor, right? The ordering may have been in some way, let's say you forgot an acquire here, right? You forgot this acquire, and basically somehow uh, there's no sequential consistency in the system. So it becomes much more difficult to debug that base. It's hard to quantify it, of course, but you, you need to imagine it a little bit. And I think that's, uh, that's one disadvantage of these relaxed models. Uh, when your program is correct, maybe if you still want to debug it, debugging is harder. But when your program is wrong, it becomes harder to reason about where things might have gone wrong. It's already hard to reason about where things might have gone wrong if you have sequential consistency. It becomes harder if you have release consistency or, uh, on top of that. OK. And this is a clear example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Sequential consistency is beautiful and nice, clean. Uh, very strict. As a result, the burden is heavily on the microarchitects. Programmers' burden is very little. Uh, well, they still need to correctly synchronize their programs. Uh, but if you, if you actually have weaker consistency models, burden becomes more and more on the programmer. And the microarchitect is a bit more relieved, let's say, because there are, there are other techniques to improve performance. Uh, you don't need to check the ordering uh, at, at every load and store. OK. And this is the last place we stopped. I, I wanted to read this a little bit more. Uh, so there's been a lot of research into uh, understanding how to improve the performance of these memory consistency models. And this is an early work in that area. Basically, this work shows that when you combine prefetching and speculative execution, the impact of consistency model on performance is not that much. 
But again, these are studies that were done like 20, 30 years ago. So memory latencies were not as high at that point in time. So people have repeated these studies and repeatedly find, found similar things overall. Basically, if you have a better out of order execution, better prefetching, larger instruction windows, then uh, the performance of your uh, memory model is not that important. But this doesn't say anything about complexity, of course, right? Clearly, you can add, you can keep adding larger instruction windows to do better speculative execution uh, to cover for the additional latency for rating uh, uh, or ordering, let's say. I will call this additional latency for ordering requests. Now your complexity is increasing, of course. That's why I think the weaker models are nice because they take away some of the complexity in the end because you don't need to do this ordering at every... Uh, basically, what, what does ordering cost? Ordering requires you to wait. Waiting means additional latency. And if you want higher performance, you need to tolerate that latency. How do you tolerate that latency? Prefetching, speculative execution. Right? These are two key techniques that we have seen. Add caching on top of that also, but caching is assumed basically in all of this. Uh, the problem is if your latencies keep getting higher, you, the, these techniques need to be even more aggressive and they require more buffering, et cetera. So there's still this fundamental trade-off that sequential consistency is costly because it requires more and more buffering and release consistency or weaker consistency models are less costly because they require less buffering in general because you don't need to do as much waiting for ordering. And I don't think this trade-off has been really solved yet. Make sense? So, uh, yes, please. By buffering, you just mean like, my, by more buffering, you just mean like increasing the cache size or like increasing the look ahead window for prefetching. So yeah, in, increasing the prefetching window, increasing the out of order execution window, as opposed to having 128 instructions, for example, have ten, thousands of instructions in flight. Because you're not able to retire or finish the instruction at the head of the reorder buffer because you need to wait for ordering uh, acknowledgement, right? Okay. Okay. So many existing processors implement some sort of relaxed consistency model. And unfortunately, this is a part of the architecture that's not very well, let's say, documented. And the wording is not that great, also, frankly. You can look at the architecture manuals and see what I mean if you're interested. Okay. That brings us to cache coherence. Uh, so, caching, remember, uh, we, we discussed this. Caching complicates ordering of all operations, as we said. A memory location can be present in multiple caches. And this prevents the effect of a store or load to be seen by other processors. It makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order for all memory operations. Remember, consistency was about global order. And we discussed why that's important. But caching also complicates ordering of operations to a single memory location. Forget about the global order right now. Think about a single memory location, a word that you're updating. One processor wants to make it five. The other processor wants to make it eight. What value do you get for that single memory location? And that single memory location may be present in multiple caches. And this makes it difficult for processors that have cached that memory location to have the correct value of that location in the presence of updates to that location. If you don't have updates, caching is great, right? You have 10,000 processors. Every processor caches the exact the same word. And nobody's updating the, that word. Every processor has very fast access to that word. They don't need to go to memory. And if the locality is great, caching works perfectly. So these are read-only accesses. But whenever someone updates that location, what happens to the remaining 9,999 processors, caches, right? If they want to read that location, again, what value should they get, basically? OK, so very quickly again, consistency is about ordering of all memory operations from different processors to different memory locations. And that's the global ordering of accesses to all memory locations, as we discussed. And we discussed why this is important. Uh, Whereas coherence is about order, uh, ordering of operations from different processors to the same memory location. And this is local ordering of access to each cache block. Again, these are both uh, needed for shared uh, updates, right? So well, I, I will also make one distinction. Maybe this is a more semantic distinction, but consistency, if, you're, if you correctly synchronize your program, consistency is really, in the end, should be about the synchronization operations, locks, semaphores, flags, etc. You really need consistency across those operations as we have discussed just now, right? So it's really about synchronization operations. Coherence is about data that protects uh, shared data as well as about shared data. So if, if let's say all synchronization operations are locks, 
uh, consistency is about ordering, global ordering across all locks, let's say, and the release is basically that data that's associated with it. Whereas coherence is about just locks as well as shared data. So coherence is also concerned about the data structures because a data structure may be cached in one, in one cache and in some other cache. And even if, even, even if you correctly synchronized and correctly provided consistency, whenever that shared data is update, updated in a critical section by one processor, another processor should still get that update right, to that shared data. So coherence, even though it's about each cache block, each cache block can be belonging to the shared data as well as the uh, lock, up, uh, lock data. Makes sense hopefully, right? It's good to think about the semantic implications perhaps of these things. Okay, these are some readings. Actually, I mean, if we, were, if we had a parallel computer architecture course, I would recommend this book, even though it's an old book, it covers the fundamentals really well. This uh, book by David Culler and Jaswin Dar Singh. Uh, and if you're interested in a good reading about cache coherence, these chapters are actually very good in terms of a fundamental treatment of cache coherence. And I think some of these papers I have assigned. Uh, actually, one of the earliest papers is this paper that, that introduces directory-based cache coherence. And then we're going to talk about Snoopy cache coherence as well. Okay. So we've already discussed shared memory model. I'll go through this quickly. Uh, clearly, we're discussing issues with shared memory. The processor zero writes an address, followed by processor one reading that address. This implies there's some communication between the two. And clearly, each read, read should receive the last value written by anyone. And this requires synchronization. Basically, synchronization is all about what does last written mean, right? Semantic level. You synchronize because you have some meaning about last written, and you dictate that meaning with your synchronization operations as a programmer. Right? If you, you, need, you need to think about this maybe a little bit, but that's, that's what you're doing as a programmer. By synchronizing, you're really ordering, uh, uh, ordering the threads in some way. It may be a dynamic order. It may not be under your control, but you're still ordering operations uh, uh, and threads that access shared data. Okay, but now we're going to concern ourselves with what if this memory location A is cached at either end? Potentially, both processors can cache it. And I, uh, the basic question is basically, if multiple processors cache the same block, how do they ensure they all see a consistent state? So let's take a look. This is memory location X. Initially, it's in main memory. It has a value of 1,000. Processor 2 loads it. It gets 1,000. Processor 1 loads it. It gets 1,000. Everything is good so far. If everything is read-only, no problem. But now processor one decides to update it to 2000. Then the question is what happens now, right? What should processor two see? I would argue that should not, uh, processor two should not load 1000 if you have correctly synchronized your programming, right? If you have not correctly synchronized, then you must have omitted a lock or somewhere, then I don't know, all bets are off, of course, right? But intuitively, if, if this is supposed to happen before this, which implies correct synchronization, then processor two should not load 1000. Of course, now you can act maybe, maybe you can think a, little, a bit deeper and say, oh, maybe, maybe there are some orderings, uh, maybe there are some timestamp associated with it, then uh, this may be acceptable under some conditions that, that it loads 1000, as long as you can order the operations nicely, right? But that requires a different sort of execution model, right? Potentially. And, Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you if you think about it, let me know. Uh, let me know at the end. So let's let's cover the basic right now. But what I said right now it can be questioned actually, because if your semantic ordering allows you to get that data without causing any problem semantically in your program, yes, you can actually get that one thousand. But that's not what we're going to assume right now. That requires some high level semantic ordering in your programs, like transactions, for example, right? Maybe. Maybe all of these uh, things are executing transactionally, and uh, this transaction that's updating this location can be ordered after this transaction that's getting the staled value at a, some global perspective uh, of the program. Okay, if you didn't understand any of that, don't worry, because it's very high level right now. But intuitively, this should not happen uh, in, the, in the models that we have discussed so far. Meaning this, this, this processor too should not uh, load the stale value. Okay, so now, now the, then the question becomes, who should make sure that that processor too should not load that stale value, right? Well, it could be the software, it could be the hardware, it could be a cooperation. And I would argue that here, again, you have the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Let's take a look at some software approaches relatively quickly, right? 
So can the program ensure coherence if caches are invisible to the software? Maybe, right? If you have coarse, well, it may, maybe is the wrong answer. Caches should be some in some manner visible to the software so that you can flush the data, for example, right? But you can, for example, do coarse grained approaches. They have page level coherence, meaning you can lock the pages somehow. Of course, somehow you need to uh, provide coherence on that lock bit, right? And that's part of your shared memory also, right? How do you provide coherence on that lock bit? Which is basically indicating this page is locked by this process. Now you're back to square one kind of. Maybe it's an easier problem because you're not trying to provide coherence across everything, but this just is lock of page, uh, uh, data that is protecting your pages, right? So think about that. But coarse grained approaches are possible using virtual memory. In the end, they require some coherence, as I discussed. Uh, but I'm not going to discuss these coarse grained page level approaches. And we're going to get back to this a little bit maybe later on. Uh, basically, you need to protect a page and a processor updates that page and finishes the updates. And then somehow those updates need to be propagated to some other processor. Right? You still have the problem of how, that, how does that data uh, get updated? Normally, what you do is you can flush your caches. Like you take a page, you do some operations on part of that page. And you flush your cache of that page, right? And then some other processor can load, get the lock on that page, and then operate on data on that page, and then flush its cache. That way, you can provide coherence. It's cumbersome, and it still requires some coherence on the locking mechanism. Non-solution is make shared locks and data non-cacheable. Basically, get rid of caches, right? It's clear that's not a solution, but that's a software solution also, right? But that's evading the solution. That's not solving the problem. Right? The problem is cache coherence. You cannot say I solve the problem by making everything. Uh, basically by getting rid of coherence is a problem. So that has significant overheads as we will see later on also. A combination of non-cacheable and coarse grain is also doable. I'll let you think about what that means. It's basically you still do coarse grain, but then maybe you do non-cacheable updates to the coarse grain place things that are, you're protecting. But again, performance is not good if you have non-cacheable accesses. Okay, fine grain becomes interesting now. Basically, what if the ISA provided some instructions to help you with coherence at the software level? For example, what if the ISA had a cache flush instruction? Cache flush can be implemented in different granularities and different ways also. For example, flash local flushes or invalidates the cache block containing address A from this processor who's executing it, that processor's cache. Now, is this useful? It could be useful if you want to allow that to be accessed by someone else, right? That data to be accessed by someone else. But this usefulness is limited. Flash global is a little bit more useful, uh, meaning uh, this, the program or the processor uh, executes a flash global instruction. And this instruction semantics is such that a uh, system flushes and invalidates the cache block containing address A for all other processors' caches. Now this is becoming interesting. Right? If you want to update a block, maybe you want this flash global, right? It's kind of an invalidate signal, basically. Well, the program, you can expose this to the programmer, then the programmer starts using these instructions. Now they go crazy. Why? Because how do you actually orchestrate this across many, many processors, right? And what if you run into race conditions? Two processors are doing flush global. And somehow you need to ensure that, uh, yeah, the data basically is, is only in one processor when, it, when, it, when that processor updates it, right? So there is a danger here. If you actually do this, completely in the program level, uh, you need some other mechanisms also on top of this. Again, I'm going through this relatively quickly, but because I want to get to the meat of the uh, lecture, but these, these issues, like the, uh, this sort of instructions are very difficult for the programmer to manage in general. Flush cache, and some of these instructions already exist, right? There's the CL flush instruction, but this purpose are not cache coherence in general. It's purpose are something else. Uh, or maybe it's purposes help with the, overheads of cache coherence sometimes actually. Uh, for example, alpha ISA had this write hint instruction. The idea is the processor executes this write hint instruction and the write hint instruction says, oh, the, this processor is going to uh, execute a write operation to this memory location soon, assuming it's placed correctly in the program. And that write hint instruction is used by the system so that system flushes other caches. And when the processor actually does the write, the data is in its cache and it can do the right without telling anyone, basically. That's the idea. It's a hint for the coherence protocol, which is going to be in hardware, we will see. But if you want to do a program with these primitives at least, maybe you'll come up with a better primitive than what I've come up with. It's very difficult to orchestrate. So flush cache is 
a bit heavy handed, it flushes basically and invalidates all blocks in cache X. So you can flush your entire cache, for example. And this sort of operations could be useful for processing in memory also, right? If, if you want processing in memory engine to uh, work on some piece of data, you say, oh, I'm going to flush my cache. Now, processing in memory engine, work on it. Sure, but still, you need to synchronize, right, nicely. Okay, and you can have different granularities also. Okay, granularity and coherence is interesting because, uh, unfortunately, our memory systems are not flexible enough, and we always run into granularity issues. What granularity should coherence be done at, right? As you can see, uh, it could be cache block granularity, it could be cache granularity, it could be page granularity, it could be even finer granularity, if you can keep track of the dirtiness and coherence uh, permissions. So granularity issues actually plague us in the memory system, unfortunately. We have kind of seen it in earlier uh, lectures also. But here, uh, the overheads will also be dependent on the granularity. And I don't think we have figured out a way of uh, designing flexible granularity systems because that comes with its own overheads, basically. Okay, so I will let you think about this, but I think it's interesting to do this thought exercise. But uh, these kind of software solutions have been proposed, employed in systems, uh, for example, I mentioned the cell processor, IBM cell processor yesterday. It, it basically relied on something like this, this sort of uh, programmer level flushing of memories, local memories. They called the local memories, not caches, because they were pro completely programmer managed. But essentially, it's a cache, right? Programmer managed cache. And it relied on this sort of instructions, and programmers went crazy, basically. It's, it was, you can, you can see that it's very difficult to program. Okay, so hardware, which we're going to focus on in this rest of lecture, is great, basically greatly simplifies software's job. And this is one example where hardware support is really definitely needed. Uh, another example is virtual memory, actually. If you, if you think about uh, where uh, programmers' life has been extremely, uh, let's say, made easy with some architectural mechanisms, if I have to give two examples, I would say virtual memory and cache coherence. Virtual memory allows the programmer not to manage memory. And cache coherence allows the programmer not to manage caches. Done. <laughs> you just need to manage processors. And hopefully they are already easy to program, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, it greatly simplifies software's job. And one idea is to invalidate all copies, all other copies of block A when a core or processor writes to A. So it's very similar to the Splash Global, right? If a processor wants to write to a block hardware, completely transparently to the programmer. The programmer doesn't need to issue any instruction, just needs to do a store to a location. The hardware basically invalidates that block from all other caches. And now it guarantees that the, the block exists only in this cache and the write happens and there's no co coherence problem, consistency problem. That's one way, clearly. We will see there are multiple ways. You could, you could say, I'm not going to invalidate. I'm going to update all of the caches. Right. This processor is writing to this cache, the block, and this is the value. These other caches have that location. If I write only to this cache, the other caches will have the stale value. So instead of writing only to this cache, I'm gonna to write to all caches that already have the block. That's an update-based protocol, basically. There are two different kinds of protocols, one is update-based and the other is invalidate-based. Of course, you can have a combination of that also. You can say, oh, these caches I'm gonna update, these caches I'm gonna invalidate. If you know enough about the pattern of accesses of the caches, that may be a good idea. But of course, as you keep doing this, things become more complicated. Okay, so let's start with a very simple coherence scheme. And this is called the VI or valid invalid coherence scheme. Basically it's a, a cache block can be in two states, valid or invalid. And by definition now you say that, oh, there, I cannot have dirty data in my cache block, right? Because there's no modified state. Uh, and in this case, caches snoop or observe each other's write and read operations. If a processor writes to a block, all others invalidate the block. So it's an invalidation-based protocol. And this is the state machine for a cache block. Well, what does this mean? Well, first of all, we're assuming a write-through cache and we're not allocating the cache on a write. So basically you can, uh, whenever you're writing to a block, you're just updating memory. You're not updating the cache itself. Uh, if the block is not present in the cache. That's, that's, that's what write, no, alloc, no write allocate means, right? If the block's present in the cache, then you write uh, to the cache, and you also write to the memory, because this is write through, right? There's no modified state. Uh, 
OK, and just a simple protocol, valid, invalid. Uh, and we're going to use uh, this, this sort of terminology. Uh, basically, a local processor has some actions on the cache block. It can read the cache block. It can write to the cache block. And based on its actions, there are actions that are broadcast on the bus. So we're going to assume a bus-based update. We're going to talk about interconnects next time. It doesn't have to be a bus-based update. It can be a virtual bus that's implemented in some way. But bus is easy, of course. Uh, a shared medium helps. And uh, whenever the processor does some action, there could be an action that's broadcast on the bus for that block, bus read, bus write. And other processors see the signal. So let's take a look at this. For example, uh, yeah, email, let's start with this one. Uh, you don't have the cache block in your cache. You do a processor read, meaning you read the cache block. You send a bus read signal uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the shared medium, shared bus, and you read the block and get, get it into the valid state. Boring, right? This, this doesn't have any implications. So there may be valid, many copies of the valid block in all caches, right? Now, this is the interesting part. Uh, the processor writes to a valid block. It issues a bus write signal. So this is this processor's perspective. Another processor that has the block as valid sees the bus write signal to that block and basically invalidates its copy. That's the idea. This also assumes that whenever the processor writes to the block, it writes to the memory. Because remember, this is a write-through cache. OK? Anything you want to discuss here? Yes. Uh, isn't this in some way a non-solution as well? Because we're basically getting rid of dirty blocks. Well, I wouldn't say it's a non-solution. Uh, it's an easy solution uh, because this allows you for, uh, to, uh, uh, so for, for example, for read-only data, you can share it without any problem. Does that make sense? I uh, know, but when you're writing, uh, we're basically getting rid of dirty writes. We're just directly writing to memory all the time. But you're also writing to your local cache. But you're also writing to also memory. Also writing to memory. Yes, basically. So you don't have dirty blocks, yes. Uh, but you can still uh, service that write relatively quickly from your cache, basically. So you're still getting the benefit of caching. But you have overheads as well, because your cache is right through right now. That's what I would say. <laughs> yes, it's not the best solution. I agree. And we're going to make it better. OK, so I think you've identified uh, one problem, basically. Whenever you write to a block, uh, you're also uh, sending uh, writing to memory. And, and this is a disadvantage of write-through cache to begin with. Uh, and we're going to fix that problem. Maybe you can close some of the windows if it's cold. Or maybe, maybe that window in the middle. <laughs> yeah, OK, so let's, let, let's talk about non-solutions, basically, now that you <laughs> kind of, I would say this is not a non-solution. But non-solution is no hardware-based coherence, right? Keeping cache coherent is software's responsibility. Clearly, this makes microarchitect's life easier, makes average programmers' life harder, much harder, I would say. And now they need to worry about hardware caches to maintain program correctness. Right? The hardware structure is really exposed to them for correctness, which is not good, right? And there's overhead in ensuring uh, coherence in software, page protection, page-based soft coherence, non-cacheable, et cetera. All of them are, have overheads and also programming complexities. All caches are shared between all processors. That's another potential solution, right? Which is actually, which gets benefits similar to the previous one, but also has the modified uh, capability more, more easily potentially. But again, this is not solution, no solution. There's no need for coherence in this case, clearly, but shared cache becomes a bottleneck in this case, right? It's a bandwidth bottleneck as well as a latency bottleneck. It's very hard to design a scalable system with low latency cache access this way. Because we're talking about all caches. We're not just talking about the last level cache, which is farther away from the processor. And we discussed in digital design and computer architecture, for example, we said L1 cache is very tightly integrated with the pipeline. Its, uh, its performance characteristics are dictated by the frequency in the pipeline, for example. So you cannot make it large. Uh, you cannot make it long latency, et cetera. So we, uh, this is, uh, I will call this a non-solution. OK, so uh, basically, let's, before we develop bigger, uh, better protocols, uh, let's talk about coherence a little bit more. So clearly, you need to guarantee that all processes see a consistent value uh, or consistent updates for the same memory location. Writes to location A by P0 should be seen by P1 eventually at some point. And all writes to A should appear in some order. So you need to provide two things, actually, for this. Write propagation, meaning guarantee, you need to guarantee that updates will propagate to different caches. And you need to serialize, basically. You need to provide a consistent order, a local order, seen by all processes for the same memory location. So in a sense, it has some similarities uh, to uh, ordering, uh, 
global ordering, but now you're talking about a local order here. But we were not concerned about rights specifically in uh, memory ordering, for example, earlier. So basically, you need a global point of serialization for this kind of store ordering. And we will see different ways of handling this global point of serialization for a cache block. So the basic idea is a, pro a cache or processor, I'll, call, I'll, I'll use this interchangeably, processor or cache, uh, because I'm going to assume that the processor is coupled with a cache. Uh, broadcasts, and this is a private cache, it was not a shared cache. Uh, it, it broadcasts updates or write to a memory location to all other processors. Another cache that has the location either it updates or invalidates its local copy. Right? Then the question is basically, how can we safely update replicated data? So let's talk about, uh, before, going to, before we go into clients uh, like protocols or models, let's talk about some issues that uh, lead into different types of models, which is updating versus invalidation, right? This is interesting now. So one option is you can have an update-based protocol, meaning whenever you're writing to a cache block, you push the updates, uh, to all the copies that are present in the system. The other the second option is ensure there's only one copy, which is local, and then update it. So these are two extremes, let's say. There could be in-between approaches that update some of the copies in the system, right? So basically, when I read, if the local copy is invalid, it puts out some requests. If another node has a copy, it returns the copy, meaning gives it back to you. So there, there could be a cache-to-cache -cache transfer. Also, otherwise memory does. Even this is a trade-off, right? Who should you get the uh, who should you get the block that you're looking for? Should you get it from some other processor or should you get it from memory? There's no correctness issue in this case, but there's a performance issue potentially, right? Maybe memory is faster. Maybe you have some. Maybe your the processor that has the cache block is farther away from you, right? Maybe there's some contention with caches. Who knows, right? Usually memory is slower than cache, but who knows? Because of the contention, memory the local memory can be faster for you. Okay, on a write, read the block into the cache as you would normally do. If you have an update protocol, update-based protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast written data and address to the shares, and the shares basically update. Other nodes update the data if the, in their caches if the block is present. That's, uh, that has a specific name. A share is uh, a, a processor or a cache that has the block that is being updated, basically. Okay. Okay, so you need to be careful about race conditions potentially here, right? Whenever you're implementing the protocol. Uh, invalidate protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast invalidation of the address to all shares and all, all nodes, all shares, invalidate the block in their cache if the block is present. That's what a share means again. Okay, so which one do you want? That's the question now. Do you want update or invalidate? Who says update? <laughs> are you sure? Or you have a question? Who says invalidate? Okay, I think invalidate wins the popular vote. I will say the answer is it depends. <laughs> it really depends on your sharing behavior as well as the frequency of updates, right? In the end. Let's take a look at an example. Uh, yeah, basically that's what I said. So updates. Uh, for example, if your share set is constant and updates are infrequent, uh, updates-based protocols usually avoid the cost of invalidate and require because you invalidate a block and then some other uh, processor that is invalidated block will be acquiring it again, right? And then while it, if, it, if it's right to that block, it will invalidate everyone else. And then some other processor will be acquiring it again. So you keep basically doing, playing this ping ponging game, let's say. This is the ping pong. Uh, it's called ping ponging, actually. Uh, where each processor sends an invalidate, everybody invalidates, and one processor acquires and then writes and then sends an invalidate, and they basically do it in some order or whatever order, maybe the order is dynamic completely. Right? But if these updates are not happening frequently and the share set is constant, maybe you just broadcast to those shares, right? So if you have a broadcast update pattern, does that make sense? That way you don't need to uh, invalidate and requ require, everybody keeps the value, right? Because you don't have the cost of additional invalidation and requ requires, data gets updated in the other cache and that other cache has the data. Because with the invalidation, you just send the data as well. Hopefully that makes sense. In this case, the data uh, may be uh, used once in a while and updated once in a while. But if the data is rewritten without intervening reads by other cores, updates would be useless. So you update somebody else's cache and then somebody else updates it and then somebody else updates it and nobody's reading the data. 
basically you're sending updates all over the place without anybody needing those updates. That's where the uh, sharing behavior as well as the write frequency, as well as read, uh, like read to write behavior of the data uh, is important. And here, I think it's good to distinguish potentially locks. I mean, even locks have different properties, but shared data also has properties. Right? Shared data, for example, if different, if you somehow protected your data structure in a, with a coarse grain lock and uh, different uh, processors are updating different portions of your data structure, update-based protocols are actually very inefficient, right? Because everybody updates everybody's caches, whereas uh, the other process may not actually need those updates, right? So it really depends on who reads the updated data, who needs it. Whereas locks, it may be good to do updates if the share set is, let's say, small, and you know that there's some ping-ponging behavior that may happen if you have invalidate re requires that may happen a lot. Okay, and then right through cache policy, the basic updates are a way, a, a way of thinking about updates is you're really doing right through your cache, not to memory, but to other caches, right? And if you do, the data bus can become a bottleneck in this case because you're using the data bus to send the data all the time. Whereas if you don't send the data, you just need to send an invalidate signal, which is one bit, right? Whereas data bus could be used for something else if you don't do a lot of updates. So there is a place where update-based protocols are good, and there's a place where invalidate-based protocols are good. Basically, the, 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 the upside with invalidation-based protocols is that after invalidation, core has exclusive access rights, right? which means that uh, only cores that keep reading after each write retain a copy. And if that's the behavior of your sharing, then that's good, right? Basically, if no one else is going to read the update that you're doing, just do it locally, right? That's, that's what invalidation enables you to do. That way you don't waste a lot of bandwidth uh, doing updating other cores. But again, uh, I mean, this is, I, I think we already talked about it, but if write contention is high, if uh, you have a lot of writes, uh, this leads to ping-ponging, uh, which is the rapid invalidation reacquire traffic from different processes. So again, this is a trade-off. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer, I think. I wouldn't pick one protocol over here. I would, if you really want to optimize your protocol, I would try to figure out what are the sharing patterns. And if you have a customizable protocol, you basically pick the updates if your sharing pattern makes sense to pick the update or otherwise pick the invalidate. And maybe different data structures, different. And again, this is a function of different data structures, different locks, different ways you programmed the data structures, how much sharing there is, et cetera. So it's, not, it's a complex problem, actually. You have a question? Yes. Wouldn't the last point sort of be negated if we're using the write through version? Because then they wouldn't be reacquiring it every time. If, if I understand right, uh, correctly, the write contention means that multiple processors mm -hmm. are writing frequently to the same location. Yes. Uh -huh. So if you have the write through, wouldn't they just avoid reacquiring it in the cache and just write through permanently? With the invalidate based protocol? Okay. Wouldn't so. Negative, a little less negative because there won't be firing. Let me think. If so, if you, if you, oh, if you, if you have a write through cache, yeah, I guess if you, if you have a write through cache, maybe yes. But then you're, you're, you're still not updating some other uh, cache, right? So you're writing, the, this processor writes the cache block and then it invalidates everyone else. Even though you have write through, it's in memory. So the memory has the copy, this cache has the copy. Now this other processor wants to write to the cache block, same cache block, let's say a lock, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it basically invalidates everyone else and gets the data from the memory, right? So write through doesn't really help the re reacquire because you don't have the data in your cache. Could you say it again? I, I couldn't hear. But I think before we said that uh, if it it only like writes to the cache if the block is already there. If the block isn't there, it ignores the cache and writes directly to the memory. Oh, okay, I see, it. I see, I see. Yeah, uh, well, that was okay. That was one protocol. That was a valid invalid protocol. Yes, there, we'll we'll see optimizations to it right now. But yes, that's not a very good protocol in the sense that you go to memory all the time, right? Whenever you do a write. Yeah. Yeah. I see, I see. I think basically this discussion is more general than that simple protocol that we discussed earlier. And hopefully you will see this soon. Yeah, yes. 
Uh, we might actually get to this later, but is the cutting edge right now then to use some kind of heuristics to partition parts of the memory into, I mean, caches and to update and validate? And if so, are the heuristics good or is there like a lot of room between them and the ideal? Well, uh, so that's a good question, basically. I think the cutting edge definitely uses some sharing behavior. It's, well, it's cutting edge, let's say, uh, in academia. I don't think these complicated protocols are uh, implemented in industry as much. Uh, but certainly cutting edge in academia tries to keep track of share sets, for example, and uh, uh, estimate this sharing behavior and tries to adapt different parts of the data structures or part of memory regions to uh, figure out which one does better. And the heuristics are still not good enough, yes. <laughs> I don't know the exact numbers, but there, there's a, and again, it's, it's, not, it's also very much dependent on the program. But even though there are heuristics, they're not uh, that great. Basically, you're trying to predict who is going to touch one location later on and what kind of access will that be, right? And that's not that's fundamentally a different, a difficult prediction mechanism or prediction problem. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> okay, this is good to think about. I like, I like the, th the fact that you guys are thinking. Okay. Now let's talk about methods. So uh, different methods, uh, so these are orthogonal. Basically this update versus invalidate is orthogonal to the methods that we're gonna discuss. Methods are also called like protocols, let's say. But actually there are two different kinds of methods that can implement multiple different protocols. Uh, but basically, how do you ensure that proper caches are updated? And there are two major methods for cache coherence today. One is called the Snoopy bus. It's easy to think about. Uh, Basically, you have, you're assuming that every processor, every cache is connected with a single bus and uh, updates or, or, or any access is visible on this bus. And this bus provides a single point of serialization for all memory requests. And processors observe other processors' actions on this bus. For example, if processor one makes a read exclusive request, so I'm just introducing new terminology because it's used. Actually, terminology is a very heterogeneous, let's say, in cache coherence. That's why I'm going to use different kinds of terminology also to get you acclimated. Read exclusive means I want to read this block because I'm going to write to it. I want to get it exclusively for myself, basically. Uh, so processor one makes this read exclusive request for address A on bus. Processor zero sees this and invalidates its copy of A. It could also update its copy of A. That's why these are orthogonal, right? Snoopy bus basically says you have the single point of serialization. Directory is fundamentally more scalable. You don't have a single point of serialization for all memory requests. You have a single point of serialization per block. And that different points of serialization can be distributed across different nodes. And that's what makes it more scalable. You don't need this bus uh, single point of serialization for everything, basically. What you really need is that single point of serialization per block. And actually, to implement this, I call the single point of serialization per block as a middleman. Basically, you have a middleman. And if you want to gain access to a block, you basically go through this middleman. And middleman basically orchestrates everyone's accesses. We kind of discussed this yesterday, actually, when we were talking about memory ordering. It's kind of a similar idea. Uh, so processors make explicit requests for blocks to this, what's called directory, basically. Uh, but again, directory can be distributed. You don't need to go to a single place. There could be thousands of places on the chip. This place is dedicated for memory region X. And all block requests, uh, all cache block requests for memory region X should get permissions from this part, right? This directory. And processor makes an explicit request for a block. Directory tracks which caches have each block. And directory coordinates invalidations and updates. So there's a, a point of indirection. The directory is really a point of indirection to enable access. So for example, processor one asks directory for an exclusive copy. Directory asks processor zero to invalidate because the directory knows exactly which processors have the block. Not everybody has to invalidate now. Only the processors that have the data have, have to invalidate because directory has all the knowledge about who's sharing what in the system. And then wait for an acknowledgement and then response to processor one saying, now I know that you are the only one who will have this data. So here's the data, do whatever you want with it. That's the idea. So fundamentally, even though it's lo longer latency, it's more scalable because it's easier to scale this up. This is harder to scale it up because you need to have some sort of shared medium or you need to provide the illusion of a shared bus, which is called a virtual bus in general. And that turns out to be difficult to do because now you have to timestamp all your requests and you need to do the ordering somewhere. 
with timestamps, etc. It becomes a little bit of a mess, if you will. Whereas directory, you don't need timestamps actually, because whatever order you receive the requests, you can service them in that order, or you can reorder internally. As long as you satisfy the coherence requirements, you're fine, right? Whereas here, there's a serialization. Uh, yeah, it's a different substrate, basically. Okay, so let's go into directory-based cache coherence. Any questions on these two methods? And I, I've assigned some papers. Uh, so this is a hard to read paper, the earliest paper that introduced directory. And this is uh, different protocols for Snoopy bus. And we're gonna cover especially this paper, which is a lot of impact in, uh, uh, in coherence protocols. Okay, directory, as I said, you have a logically central, but for a physically distributed directory that keeps track of where the copies of each cache block reside. And caches essentially consult this directory to ensure coherence. Let's go through an example mechanism. For each cache block in memory, the directory stores P plus one bits in the directory. P is number of processors in the system, or you can think of it as number of caches. Right? Basically, for each cache block, you have a bit saying whether that cache has the block or not doesn't have the block. That's P bits. And there's a, one extra bit. What is that for? Anybody can guess? Yes. <laughs> It says basically the cache that has the block, that has the bit set, also has exclusive access. You will see, you don't actually need a bit for memory in this particular mechanism. Uh, okay, so one bit for each cache, indicating whether the block is in the cache. And, and there's an exclusive bit, that additional bit is, this indicates that a cache has the only copy of the block and can update it without notifying others. So this way the directory knows, oh, this cache is doing whatever it wants to this block, and if I really want to, and my block, is, my copy is not correct at this point. My copy is not up to date. So if I really want to get this block, I should tell this cache, give me the block, revoke its rights, get the block, and I now can do whatever I want with the block. Basically, this exclusive bit says that directory doesn't have the update, up to date copy, and it doesn't have the control at this point. It should get the control or permissions for the block itself if it wants to do, uh, distribute the block to someone else. Makes sense, right? Okay. But of course, you can extend this uh, directory more. So when I read, uh, you can actually make this more complicated, right? This is one directory-based protocol, clearly. When I read, uh, the directory sets, so uh, 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 a cache wants to read a block, right? What does the directory do? It sets the cache's bit and arranges the supply of the data to that block, uh, to that cache. When I write, the directory invalidates all caches that have the block and reset their bit. Resets their bits, basically. That's the idea. Well, I'm going to give you an example with my terrible handwriting soon. <laughs> and the exclusive bit associated with each block in the cache is useful because the cache can update the exclusive block silently. Right? If the cache has exclusive access to that block, it doesn't need to notify anyone, including the directory. OK, so this is my beautiful handwriting, let's say. <laughs> but this is very simple. You have, in this case, you have p equals 4, 4 bits. And you have an exclusive bit over here. If you see this, and if you're told that this is the directory entry for a block, you immediately know some information about the block, right? No cache has the block. So the directory must have the copy. Right? Now let's say P1 gets a read miss to block A. P1 sends a request to the directory saying, I want block A. The directory looks at this bit vector. It says, okay, you can have block A. And it sets the bit. And it doesn't set the exclusive bit because processor one didn't ask for the block exclusively, right? Maybe it's just gonna read the block. It's not gonna to write to the block. Right? Okay, then P3 sends a request to the directory, says, I want to read the block. Then the directory says, okay, here's the block. Do whatever you want with it, right? Well, not what, I guess, I guess it takes a read-only request. So uh, the actions of the processors will be limited as to, as to what they can do, right? If they, if they want to write to the block, they want to, they want to actually, they, they have to tell the, tell the directory that they want to write to the block, right? So they cannot, do whatever they want with it if they actually ask for a read request to the directory. Does that make sense? Because the directory needs to know where the up-to-date copy is also. So basically, if you look at this picture, this picture now tells us that processor uh, one has the block, processor three has the block. None of them have it exclusive. If you actually had this bit set, then you would have a bug in your directory because two, two, uh, two processors should not have the block in exclusive state. Right? Otherwise, you would have back, you're, you're back to the coherence problem on those exclusive states. 
uh, exclusively own blocks, let's say. Uh, and the data is up to date in the directory also. So by just looking at the bits, you know what, what's happening. Okay, now let's look at a different example. Oh, what happened? Okay. Okay, so now let's say, sorry. So this is a state, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Now P2 takes a rightness, meaning it wants to write to the block. It says, I want to get this block exclusively to myself because I'm going to write to it. So what does directory do in this case? Directory examines this. P2 here doesn't have the block, and it wants to write. Who has the block? P1 has the block. P3 has the block. Now I'm going to tell them, invalidate your blocks because somebody else wants to write to it, right? And basically, processor two sends the invalidate requests and then waits for acknowledgement, let's say, so that you ensure that everything is in consistent state, right? Uh, basically, you don't have a single shared medium, shared bus, so you need to ensure that everything is consistent before you can proceed. And then processor two, two's bit is set uh, as having the block, this exclusive bit is set, and the directory sends the data to processor uh, two. Now the processor two in its cache can update the data as it wants. Right? Now it has the exclusive copy. Basically, processor two can now update the block without notifying any other processor or the directory. And on top of this exclusive bit, processor two also needs to have a bit in its cache indicating that it can perform these exclusive updates. Basically, it's got the permission from the directory uh, after all of this happened. Right? That's called the private or exclusive bit in the cache for the block. So you need to modify the caches also. You cannot just uh, modify the directory. And if you want to complicate the protocol, maybe you need to modify the caches even more. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully this is clear. So now this is the state of the directory for this cache block. Now let's say P3 takes some rightness. P P3 wants to write to the cache block. What does the directory do? I call this memory controller here, but directories are, can be implemented in the memory controller. This is kind of the discussion that we had yesterday also. It doesn't have to be. Uh, Later, we will talk about scaling the directory. Directories can be cached themselves also. Now, how do you keep the directory coherent becomes a problem. So this is like the infinite window that we saw earlier. Some of you were here in the beginning. How do you keep the mechanism that provides coherence coherent? Right? That becomes interesting, uh, but let's not go there yet. But basically, P3 takes a write miss. And what the directory does is first, request, uh, basically directory sees that it doesn't have the block up to date. Somebody has the exclusive. It tells processor two to send it the block and it downgrades processor two, meaning processor two, you don't have exclusive access to this block. You don't have any access to this block. Give it back to me. And then processor two's bit becomes zero. Processor three's become, bit becomes one. And processor T is given exclusive access and the data gets sent to processor three by the directory. And now processor three can do whatever it wants to that block. Right? And then again, let's do this one finally. If processor two takes a read miss, given the state after that, processor two wants to read the block now, what the directory does is, uh, it, the directory checks, oh, processor three has exclusive access to the block. So let me get the data from processor three. But let's, let me not tell, the process, tell processor three to invalidate because processor two is not gonna write to it. So this is a design choice again, right? The, the directory can say invalidate, but the directory chooses not to say invalidate in this particular case for whatever reason. It could be hard coded, it could be intelligent. Uh, basically, processor two keeps its data, sends it to a directory, data becomes non exclusive, and processor, uh, the directory sends the data to processor two now. So, processor two and processor three are now sharing the block. And directory has the up to date copy also, right? Make sense? Okay, so it's a very simple protocol. And you can optimize it more. Basically, directory is really the coordinator for all actions to be performed on a given block by any processor. And it guarantees correctness, it guarantees ordering. And it's also very nice to analyze. This, this makes it easier to analyze the coherence protocols if you have this sort of uh, request reply based uh, structure. Every request goes through the directory basically. Yet there are many opportunities for optimization as we will see. It can, enable, it can be enabled by bypassing the directory and directly communicating between the caches. And then the directory can orchestrate the source right. The directory knows exactly who has the data, uh, the directory knows hopefully the topology of the caches. The directory say, okay, processor two, send your data to processor three. Right? And that enables optimizations. This global view of where the blocks are enable optimizations. Whereas broadcast-based systems like the bus-based systems, Snoopy systems, they don't have a global view of where the data is. The bus 
just sees all requests. And based on that, caches take some action. Right? You never have a global view. There's no structure in the system that has a global view of where each block is. Right? You can construct it, but there's nothing that exists right now. So the, of course, that global view comes at a cost, the storage of the directory. Right? There's a lot of storage overhead as we will see. And we will see some of these example optimizations later. In fact, for example, in this prior thing, I said, processor two takes a read miss, processor three supplies it, right? Basically directory says processor three, send your block to processor two and uh, that can be done. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's talk about Snoopy cache coherence now. So uh, as I said, all caches snoop, all ca other caches read write requests and keep the cache block coherent. And for this to happen, you still need to have metadata. So the metadata in the directory now gets, needs to be in the caches themselves, right? Each cache block has coherence metadata associated with it in the tag store of the cache. And we will see what that metadata looks like. We kind of saw it with the valid invalid protocol, right? Well, it was, you, you have a state machine that uh, moves between different states. Right? Even though we didn't necessarily add additional states because valid invalid, it should already exist in a very basic cache, right? We didn't add additional states over there for coherence, but you need to have a state machine that uh, makes sure the coherence behavior is maintained. So this is easy to implement if all caches share a common bus, as we discussed, because each cache broadcast is to read-write operations on a bus. And this is usually good for small-scale multiprocessors. And this is one of the reasons why we will cover interconnects next week. We will see how to scale up uh, the systems going into the future. What if you would like to have a 10,000 node multiprocessor? So this becomes, let's say, unwieldy. You, buses don't scale beyond even 16 uh, processors due to issues that we will discuss. You have electrical loading issues. You have bandwidth problems, et cetera. You have frequency problems. What if you want to have 10,000 nodes? That's where this Snoopy cache coherence idea breaks if it ties itself to the physical implementation of a bus. But again, as I said, you can solve the problem by adding another layer, which is you can think of the bus as a virtual entity, and you just need to emulate the bus virtual entity, the characteristics of a bus, which is that basically this over here, all caches see everything in the same order on a particular medium. You don't have to have the say, you don't have to have a physical medium that satisfies. You can have a virtual medium that's implemented on a substrate that doesn't provide this guarantee. And now your task is to actually ensure that this virtual medium satisfies this guarantee. Right? But that's a difficult task also, it turns out. You need, again, you need to do this with timestamps. Or you need to change the semantics of the higher level of the program somehow. But again, we, we may discuss that later. Okay, so this again with my handwriting, but this is a processor, this is your cache. Now we have coherence metadata in your caches and you have a shared bus. Uh, and uh, basically each cache observes its own processor. So each cache sees what the processor does and each cache sees what the shared bus provides. Basically what every other processor does. And it changes the state of the cache block based on the observed actions by the processor as well as the bus. So basically you can think of the cache observing two things, what the processor does, and based on that, it sends something on the bus. And it also observes uh, what other caches do. And based on that, it changes the state of the cache block, uh, that particular block. Assuming that block that other processors are doing something to is inside the cache, of course, right? Okay, so processor, the, Again, the terminology is not consistent here, but there are processor actions to a block, processor read, processor write. These are two things that you can observe from the processor. And there are bus actions to a block coming from another processor. It could be a bus read or bus write. Right? Sometimes it could be bus read exclusive, or sometimes it can be said bus read invalidate, things like that. But bus read exclusive is the same as bus read writes for our purposes. Okay, this is a simple uh, Snoopy cache coherence protocol that we saw, right? Valid, invalid. And we don't need to discuss this further, but we will discuss what's its downsides, right? So let's extend this protocol. What if you want write back caches? So people question the write through caches and rightly, write through caches are not that good because you expose every single write to memory, right? And we said memory bandwidth is already an issue. It doesn't make sense to expose every single write to memory. So we want a modified state clearly or a dirty bit in the cache or modified bit. We'll call it the modified bit in this case, M. So this is our more sophisticated coherence protocol now. You want three states. You extend the metadata per block to encode three states, two bits. Modify, so and uh, here your semantics are very important. 
What does M mean? What does S mean? What does I mean? I is easy. Cash line is not present in the cash chart. What does M mean? Cash line is the only cash copy and it's dirty. Basically, it's exclusive, dirty. Shared cash line is one of potentially several cash copies and it's clean. It's potentially shared and clean, right? Meaning there's at least one clean cash copy. You don't know if any other cash has the copy. You know that you have the copy of the data and it's the same as what the memory has. And some other caches may potentially have the data also. So semantics become mattering here. So uh, we will see in the, in the protocols that they, you may extend the semantics of a state and you can actually get into different trade-offs. Okay, let's take a look at how this works basically. So read miss makes a read request on the bus. Uh, if, if, you, if you get a read miss in the cache, you send a read request on the bus, not read exclusive. And the, the block in the cache gets, from, uh, it's, it's, uh, you get it from somewhere. It could be from another cache, it could be from memory. And you, but from this process perspective, that cache block transitions to the shared state at that point, because you're requesting uh, a read. Makes sense, right? And semantically, this is correct because you have the cache block and you have no idea whether anybody else has a cache block, but you're, you're sure that memory has the cache block and you and the memory have the same copy. Write miss, if you take a write miss in this processor, in this cache, you make a read exclusive request and you get the data and it becomes in the modified state. And now you know that you, you're the only cache, uh, you have the data, nobody else in the system, including the memory, doesn't have the correct copy, right? You can change the semantics and have a different MSI protocol, but this makes sense, right? For a write back cache. And when a processor snoops read exclusive from another writer, meaning some other processor is writing, and you see read exclusive on the bus, it invalidates its own copy, if it has it, of course. Right? This makes sense, it's an invalidate based protocol again. Now, the good thing here is shared to modified upgrade can be made without accessing memory. Because shared uh, state, you know that you have the data. You just need to send invalidations to all caches because you don't know if you're the only one who has the data. You still need to send invalidations. And you can go to the modified state without saying, without doing anything to memory. Right. That makes sense, hopefully, also. Okay. And this is the protocol. And this is from the Color and Sing book that I mentioned. If you're interested in reading it, I would recommend it. Uh, I don't know if you want to go through everything over here. So what's interesting here? I guess, for example, this one. Uh, if you're in invalid state, you don't have the block. You send a, a processor right to the block. It sends a bus read exclusive signal, all of the other caches, and goes into the modified state. Now let's take a look at what happens. Some other cache was in modified state. It receives this bus read exclusive. It flushes. It's blocked to memory. And the block, uh, this processor that's doing a processor write, uh, gets uh, the data from that processor or the memory after it's written to memory. Makes sense, right? You need to keep track of the perspectives of different processors because each processor is executing this coherence protocol locally, right? where they're communicating over the shared bus. Okay, so again, uh, let's assume this processor is uh, writing and it sends a bus read exclusive request. Some other processor, was in shared state, which means that there should be at least one other pro one processor that's in shared state. It doesn't have to be, but no other processor can be in modified state. This processor receives the bus read exclusive. It simply invalidates its block, right? It doesn't need to flush because shared means memory already has the copy. Of course, you can extend this by saying, oh, processor X, uh, processor A was requesting it, so send the block to processor A and then invalidate your block, right? So basically you can, you can add additional actions to the coherence protocol. This is just looking at how, uh, this doesn't tell you how the data is communicated. This tells you how the state is updated, the coherence state is updated from the perspective of a local processor base. There's also an aspect of how the data is communicated uh, from where to where, basically. Okay, maybe I'll do, I'll do another one. So this is the shared state. Uh, well, I guess this is the same as the earlier version, but basically processor read or bus read, you don't do anything. You stay in the state, basically. Only when you see a bus read exclusive, then you go to invalidate. Right? And you can go from shared to modified. This is the part that I mentioned. If you're in the shared state, what you do is you send a bus read exclusive on the bus. Uh, you, you, if the processor writes to the shared block, you send a bus read exclusive. 
and you transition to the modified state. And every other processor well, invalidates its block, assuming there's another processor in the shared state. Again, I'm using processor and cache interchangeably here, as you can see, but uh, these are coupled to each other. Okay, so hopefully this is nice and easy, right? But there's one problem with it, well, at least one problem with it. So basically, a block is in no cache to begin with. Let's assume that. That's, that's the case, right? When you start, the block is in no cache to begin with. And on a read, the block immediately goes to the shared state, although it may be the only copy that's cached. And no other processor will cache in the future. You don't know the future, of course, but you know that this is the only copy. Right? So basically, this is the place. You're invalid. You do processor read. You send a bus read out. Assume that this is the only processor that's, uh, this is the only uh, copy uh, in the caches that you want. Well, okay, let me, let me revise that. Assume that the block is in no, state, uh, no other cache. This, this processor wants uh, that cache block. It sends a processor read. And then this gets translated to a bus read. Uh, and the processor gets the data and directly transitions to shared state. Now, what's the downside of this? This processor is not sure right now who has the data, right? Because shared state fundamentally means that it's potentially shared. There's at least one copy in the system. Memory has the same copy, but caches have at least one copy. And if this processor has the copy, then it knows that it's at least one of the shares. But it's not sure if anybody else has the copy, meaning it, it cannot update this block without asking for permission at this point. And this becomes a problem, basically. So why is the problem? Basically, suppose the cache that reads the block wants to write to it at some point. It has to broadcast an invalidate request, even though it has the only cache copy. But it doesn't know it's the only one who has that cache copy. So it has to send this invalidate, basically. But if the cache knew it had the only cache copy in the system, it could have written to the block without notifying any other cache. So this saves, if, if this knowledge would save unnecessary broadcast of invalidations. So you do a read, your purpose to read the data, fine. At some point, you want to write to it. No other cache has it, but you, have, you don't have any idea that no other cache has it, so you have to send an invalidate request. And this happens a lot in programs, actually. As a result, the improvement on MSI is actually big. So the solution is really messy. Basically, add this new exclusive state that's different from modified. So modified state is exclusive, but it's dirty. Shared state is potentially shared, but it's clean. Invalid is invalid. So what's missing is exclusive and it's potentially clean, right? Exclusive and clean, basically, I should say, not potentially clean, sorry. So we have, because we already have exclusive dirty, we don't have exclusive clean. So whenever we read and we didn't update the cache block, we don't know where the only person, only cache who has the cache block. So we're missing this exclusive clean state and that's going to be very useful. Yes. Wouldn't the invalidation broadcast be discarded by the other processors anyway, since they don't have the cache block anyways, they will just discard the signal. So the only benefit that I see moving from MSI to Messi is reduced bus traffic. Exactly. Uh, signal exactly. traffic. So you reduce uh, the bus traffic, but, and also uh, you need to wait, basically. You, invalidation takes time, right? No, you need because, to go through the bus. I mean, no one else has the line, right? So there's no cost attached to it, except they're reading the signal and checking if they have value. Yeah, but that takes time, basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the exclusive state. Because this is in your L1 cache, right? Your L1 cache, now you need to wait, basically. And L1 cache is very late and so critical, as we discussed. Okay, so basically, uh, add another state indicating that this is the only cache copy and it's clean. A uh, block is placed into this exclusive state if during bus read, no other cache had it. Basically, you need to have ad additional complexity. Whenever you send a bus read, you need to check if any other cache had it. And th this is a wired or shared signal on the bus that can determine this, basically. Snooping cache assert the signal if they also have a copy. If any cache has the copy, it asserts a signal and it's a wired or, meaning that if any cache has the copy, the signal is one, then basically you go into the shared state. If the signal is zero, you go into the exclusive state. That's the idea. And now silent transition from exclusive to modified is possible on write. You don't need to notify everyone. Uh, yeah. And this is MESI is also called the Illinois protocol because it was developed at the Illinois. And this is the paper that I uh, assigned to you if you're as part of the reading assignments. 
Okay, I think basically uh, I've already said everything that I want to say, but this is a depiction of what we have seen before. Uh, let's take a look at this. So, okay, basically what changes here, this is the Mezzi state machine. It's very similar to the before. You can study it on your own. Maybe the terminology is slightly different over here, but it doesn't matter. So basically going from invalid to, you can go from invalid to exclusive clean or invalid to shared clean basically. And it, it depends on whether some other processor has the block, uh, block in their cache. So this processor is reading this block. It sends a bus read to that block. And there's a wire door signal that says, oh, no other processor has it. So this processor goes to the exclusive clean state. Oh. And this process, uh, now if you go to the exclusive clean state, you can write to the block without notifying anyone. Okay. And if, if that's not the case, uh, basically uh, some, at least one other cache has it, meaning that wired or signal is true, then uh, you have to go to the shared clean state. Okay. I don't want to focus on any other aspect of it. So I've focused on these two, three arcs over here. And this is the message state machine from color and sync. And this is what you're going to implement in shared uh, optional lab five, basically. Uh, it's essentially the same protocol. Maybe the terminology is a little bit different. Well, cleaner, let's say, cleaner to read, let's say, over here. Uh, but basically, uh, let me maybe add some more terminology over here. A transition from a single owner state, exclusive or modified, that's a single owner. Both of them are exclusive states, basically. One is shared, one is clean. Uh, what did I say? No, one is clean, one is dirty. Yeah. If both of them are exclusive states, one is clean, one is dirty. Uh, and uh, a transition from that exclusive state to a shared state is called a downgrade because the transition takes away the permission, owner's right to modify the data, right? A transition from a shared state to a single owner state is called an upgrade because the transition grants the ability to the owner to modify the data. So you can, you'll see this terminology also, downgrade, upgrade, but essentially it talks about the ability to modify the data. And this is the uh, optional lab you're going to implement. How many people start on this, by the way? Okay, maybe it's too early. Maybe it's too optional. But you still, you still have a lot of time until uh, the end of January. And I recommend doing it. It's actually a beautiful lab, I think. It gives you a different perspective from the other labs, let's say. And this is actually very similar to the coherence protocol Intel Pentium Pro implemented. This is Pentium Pro. Again, I'm not going to go through this, but it's essentially the same. The terminology may be a little bit different, but essentially Pentium Pro implemented this protocol. Now let's talk about some trade-offs because this is not the best protocol also. Is there a question? Okay. So the question is, should a downgrade from modified go to shared or invalid? Now, what does this mean, right? Let's see. Modified is you have the data as modified. Should you go to shared or should you go to invalid? Downgrade means that somebody else is requesting the data. So you should probably downgrade. But should you invalidate your data? or should you go to a shared state? Again, this depends on your access patterns, right? You go to shared state if data is likely to be reused. This processor is going to downgrade. If, it's, if it thinks that it's going to reuse the data soon, it goes to a shared state, right? But this is not true if someone else is going to write, uh, write to the data before the data gets reused, right? That's why, that's why the access patterns matters. So before it's written by another process. Or you go to the invalid state if the data is not likely to be not reused before it's written by some other process. Again, if you can, if you have this sort of knowledge or prediction, you can optimize your uh, protocol. Cache to cache transfers. On a bus read, should data come from another cache or memory? Again, another cache is usually faster, but not always faster uh, because it, the cache could be far away, right? Again, if you have a ring-based interconnect, for example, and you have, I don't know, 600 processors, you probably don't want to ring-based interconnect for that, but it may take a long time to actually get the data from some other cache and memory may be closer to you or the memory bank you're trying to get the data from may be closer to you. So clearly memory is simpler. No need to wait to see if another cache has the data first. Again, uh, this, this becomes interesting with different interconnects. With bus-based interconnect, there's limited interest, let's say. If you want to scale up to hundreds of nodes, then it becomes interesting. Uh, so if you go to memory, there's less contention at the other caches, but requires write back on downgrade from M. So what does this mean? Basically, memory needs to have the correct data also, like if you want to get the data. Okay, 
So this is another interesting part that will enable us to develop a, add another state, let's say, to the coherence protocol. So you, you need to write back to memory when you're going from modified to shared state. Since the shared state is clean, right? The semantics of the shared state is it's clean. And when you're going from modified to shared, you need to write back to your data to the memory, right? This makes sense, right? It's, it's again a semantic issue. We're going to fix the semantic issue by creating another state with another semantics. So the question is, can we avoid this write back? Well, that should not be top memory. I don't know why it's top actually. Let's fix it right now. To memory. Okay. So that's the question basically. And we will we will discuss two solutions, at least two solutions. There are multiple solutions of the problem, but one, one possibility is to have an owner state, another state that brings us to the Moesi protocol, which is implemented in many, many processors today. A version of it is implemented. One cache owns the latest data, and me memory is not updated. Basically, this owner state says this cache is the owner, but memory is not the up to date. And other caches may have the data modified. So it's a special state, basically. And when this cache's block is going to be evicted, then this cache is going to write it back to memory because it's the owner of that block that's dirty. Is there a question over here? Okay, no. Okay. And uh, memory write back happens when all caches evict copies. So we're going to get back to this. So basically, this is the problem with MESC. Well, this is one problem with MESC. Shared state requires the data to be clean. Uh, in other words, all caches that have the block have the up to date copy, and so does the memory. That's what clean means. The problem is you need to write the block to memory when bus read happens, when the block is in modified state. And this is really not necessary, right? If your memory bandwidth is precious, especially these days, this is really not necessary to do. This is again a semantic issue because you don't have enough states to keep track of what should happen if multiple blocks are in modified state. Uh, that's, uh, that's what you're doing. So why is this a problem? Memory can be updated unnecessarily. Some other processor may want to write to the block again, right? Basically, memory bandwidth is wasted. That's why this going from Mezi and Moesi is actually important. Okay, so basically, there are two ideas to improve on this, right? One is do not transition from modified to shared on a bus read. You get a bus read, some other processor requires the data. You have the data modified and exclusive in your, uh, uh, in your cache. Uh, basically, you say that now you, you, have a, you, have, you, have, you have a choice. Should I go to the shared state, give the data to the processor, and I'll also update the memory? Or should I invalidate the data that I have, give the data to the processor, and let that processor become, have the data as modified state? That way you don't update the memory now. Right? That way you save the memory update, but this is not necessarily what you may want because you're invalidating your block also. Right? If both processes are going to write to the block at some point, maybe that's not a good idea. Again, it depends on the access patterns. That's one idea, though. The other idea is transition to from uh, modified to shared, but designate one cache as the owner who will write to the write the block back uh, when it's evicted. Make sense? But now you're changing the uh, semantics of the shared state. Right? Shared state no longer means shared and clean. Shared state now means that shared and potentially dirty. How do you distinguish whether it's dirty and clean? You need to have a global perspective. If anyone is the owner, then there must be, uh, then, then the shared state must mean shared and dirty. If there's no owner and all of the blocks are in shared state, then this, you're shared and clean, right? But you don't have, nobody has this global state, right? Okay, but this is ever a version of the Moesi protocol, basically. This saves the uh, update of the memory. You don't need to do the update of memory at the cost of an additional state and a semantic change to how the states are thought about. An owner is the one that's responsible uh, for writing the block back to memory when it's evicted. So when, when the block is evicted, and if you're in the owner state, now you have another action. You're the owner. You're going to write the block back. Basically, you need to write the block back, right? And if you're in the owner state. Okay, I'm not going to go through more optimizations because you can actually optimize this protocol even more, but uh, probably it's good to uh, discuss those later. So basically, 
The protocol can be optimized with more states and prediction mechanisms to reduce unnecessary invalidates and transfers of blocks. You can add prediction mechanisms, et cetera. You can add more states, uh, et cetera. But more states and optimizations are essentially more difficult to design and verify. They lead to more cases to take care of and race conditions also. We didn't talk about the race conditions, but coherence protocols have race conditions. When one cache is transferring, uh, basically moving from one state to another state, what happens if something else is observed on the bus, right? How do you ensure that those race conditions don't affect your correctness? It's, it's basically a mess to design in the end. And also these more states and optimizations provide diminishing returns over time. So saving a memory access is of course important. That's why mezzi to mezzi is important, right? But other optimizations may not actually provide the same sort of benefits. Okay, let's revisit the two cache coherence methods. So, I mean, we are talking about, we've talked about Snoopy bus also. We talk about directory, but let's go back to uh, the trade-offs between them. I also call it Snoopy Cache, not to be confused with the Snoopy dog. <laughs> but basically, Snoopy Cache, uh, miss latency is short, right? Assuming, again, this is scalable. You have a nice bus. Uh, you have a request. It basically gives you a bus transaction to memory, and that's your critical path, basically. You don't need to go through a middleman. Global serialization is easy. Bus provides a sort. Again, ignoring scalability issues. Bus is your arbiter in this case. And there's only one single request that can be, uh, one single signal that can be sent on the bus. And it's simple. You can adapt bus-based uniprocessors easily to this sort of multiprocessing. But of course, the downside is it now relies on broadcast messages to be seen by all caches in the same order. Again, that's, with a bus, it's easy. But if you don't have that bus or if you want to scale, it becomes difficult. Basically, you have a single point of serialization. This is not scalable, basically. And as I said, you need a virtual bus or some sort of totally ordered interconnect or a combination of both. How do you enable a virtual bus when your interconnect is not uh, providing total ordering requirements, et cetera? That's something that, that we may discuss next week. Okay, directory, on the other hand, fundamentally slower, right? You need to ask for permission. Uh, as opposed to telling everyone, I'm going to do this, take your own action, right? So in a sense, Snoopy Cache is, it's, it's interesting, right? Snoopy Cache is in a sense more distributed, but it relies on the single bottleneck. Directory is more centralized, but it can be more distributed overall, right? So they have actually this interesting tension between them. So with directory, you add indirection to miss latency, request needs to go to the directory, and then directory needs to uh, access memory. Bas uh, basically, it's, uh, it's on the critical path. It requires extra storage space to track shared sets. So there's extra storage space. I mean, I should say that Snoopy Cache also has extra metadata, but its metadata is limited to cache size. Whereas directory's metadata is a function of the entire memory plus the entire number of processors that you have, right? Whereas Snoopy Caches are, well, uh, the ca uh, Snoopy bus-based protocol that we discussed are four states per cache block, right? And the caches are of limited size, right? Not, well, four states is one example. It, with Moesi, it becomes five states, right? But it's still a much more limited number of bits. Directory is a lot bigger number of bits, as we will see. But the good news is potentially you can be approximate. You can play tricks. You can use Bloom filters, for example, to keep track of shares. And false positives are okay for correctness. If you send some more invalidates than needed, it's potentially okay, as long as you don't do the wrong thing, right? If you miss an invalidate to a cache block, to a cache that has the block, then you're in trouble. You should not miss that. But Bloom filters actually could be a good uh, thing that can be used here, and people have proposed using them. Protocols and race conditions can be more complex, especially when you have high performance, because you don't need this, you don't have this bus, basically. Again, we'll see that maybe later. But the upside, the big upside is it doesn't require broadcast to all caches. You can be very selective. And it's exactly as scalable as the interconnect and the directory storage. And this is very important. So basically, your interconnect doesn't need to be a bus right now or a virtual bus. It could be anything. Right? It could be, uh, yeah, it could be anything you can imagine as long as you can communicate between the directory and the parties that want to ac have access to the cache block. Right? And again, directory storage is something we will discuss. Okay, maybe let me finish this and then uh, we will take a break. So let's quickly revisit directory-based cache coherence. Uh, I think we've already discussed it, and we've already discussed the exact uh, example mechanism. Just to jog your memory, this is what we have. 
So usually directory-based protocols are actually required when scaling past the capacity of a single bus. It's, we don't know how to really extend uh, Snoopy protocols to let's say hundreds of nodes. And if you look at real systems, they're, they're usually a combination of Snoopy protocols and directory protocols where directory is the real medi mediator. Uh, so yeah, because uh, basically directory can be distributed. Coherence still requires a single point of serialization or write serialization and serialization location can be different for every block. As I said, you don't need to have a single entity as a directory. You can have a thousand different directories, right? On your chip, or you could have as many directories as your memory controllers. But again, it doesn't even need to be tied to your memory controllers. The directory can communicate with the memory controller also. It's basically an intermediary for access permissions and data. Now you can reason about the protocol for a single block. We have one server. You can also think about it this way, right? The directory node is the server and private cast are the clients. And you have a client server request model where the server serves both permissions as well as data. And directory receives these requests from the clients and sends invalidation requests and also data back. And invalidation is explicit in this case, as opposed to implicit in the Snoopy bus stream. So let's take a look at the data structures. Data structures are interesting. Uh, I showed you a bit vector earlier. The bit vector needs to be exact, right? Uh, but bit vector is not scalable, as we will see in, in some uh, soon. Uh, so basically, the, the, these da directory data structures are required to support invalidation and cache block requests, as we discussed. Uh, you need to basically support set inclusion set. Basically, what you need to keep track of is the set of processors that have access to the data. You need to encode that set. That, set, that encoding doesn't have to be uh, exact. It could be approximate, right? And you also need to know who, who has the data as exclusive, right? So false positives are okay, basically. You want to know which caches may contain a copy of block. You don't necessarily want to know which caches exactly do. Of course, how do you manage this becomes a problem, right? May contain is interesting, right? And false positive rate determines your performance now. So most accurate and expensive is the full bit vector, as we discussed. If you have 10,000 processors, you have a 10,000 bit vector per block. If your memory is huge, we will do this calculation soon and then we'll take a break, but it doesn't sound good basically. So a compressed representation could be possible. Link this could be possible because if you have very few shares, it may not really make sense to have actually a single bit per 10,000 processors, right? This is a trade-off now. You have 10,000 processors, that's 10,000 bits if you have a bit vector. But in, many, in all cases, let's say, I'll, I'll say all, if you have at most two shares, you can much more easily keep track of the at most two shares using a linked list potentially, right? Why? Because 10,000 processors log two to the 10,000 is a small number. And you have two times log two to the 10,000 bits to keep track of the shares plus an exclusive bit, which you still need to distinguish between which of the shares it belongs to, right? Because you don't have a direct correspondence between, yeah, uh, between a bit vector's bit and the exclusive. So basically, uh, Linked list, it could provide you a still, uh, uh, let's say, exact representation, but it could be less costly if your system has scaled up to many, many number of nodes. Okay. Uh, again, the directory actually follows the semantics of the Snoop based system, but with explicit request reply messages. In fact, you can map the MESI protocol on the directory. We didn't call the protocol with directory MESI protocol or MSI protocol, but you can think of it that way also. You don't keep track of this as state machines inside. Uh, uh, inside the caches, but you could actually implement all of those protocols using directory or bus. I think we already discussed uh, this one. Yeah, okay. So basically, I think the takeaway here is that protocol design is flexible, right? You can, it's a lot easier to design a protocol uh, where you gather the requests and then you basically decide what to reply and how to reply. So there's a lot of design choices over here. Exact forwarding paths depend on the implementation. And how do you do the cache to cache transfer? We discussed this also. Right? So let's take a look at some examples. For example, P0 uh, acquires an address for reading. So it sends a read request to the directory. This is also called the home directory for a given a cache block. The directory basically sends the data as exclusive, for example, to P0, or it can send as shared. Basically, it's a design choice also for the directory. Or the directory can say, oh, I don't have the data, P1 should send the data. Or the directory can say, I have the data, but I'm not going to send it to you. I'll ask P1 to send it to you. 
So it can basically uh, use different paths that are potentially better in the interconnect, right? Again, think of this as a very scalable system, like tens of thousands of nodes. I mean, scaling coherence to tens of thousands of nodes is an easy task, but directory provides a way of doing it more efficiently than a bus clearly. So another example, the processor zero wants to do a read exclusive request. It asks the home directory for that cache block. The directory says, oh, there's someone else who has the block exclusive. Let's call it the owner. It asks an invalidation request. It basically owner acknowledges it. And the directory, while doing that, it says, oh, invalidate your block, send it to me, but also send it to this processor zero. So basically you can actually make your messages complicated and you can actually reduce the critical path latency of the data transfer right? by, by basically directory orchestrating things better. And the hope is that directory knows the structure of the network so that it, makes, it may basically say, oh, okay, owner, you're very close to P0. Just maybe owner is actually here, right? Just give it to P0, who is your next, uh, next hop neighbor. And also send the data to me. But it's important that P0 gets it quickly. Okay, contention resolution is another interesting thing. So there are a lot of issues actually that come up uh, in directory-based protocols. For example, P0 wants a read exclusive request, ask the home directory. And at the same time, P1 wants a read exclusive request. Now you have a contention on the block. The directory uh, gives the access to P0 and sends the data. And the directory says, P1, please wait. Basically, it sends a negative acknowledgement. This is one way of handling contention, right? This doesn't arise in a bus, Snoopy bus. This does arise in the directory. Because bus is, there can be only one request on the bus at any given time, right? Okay, so that's one option. Now, clearly somebody's happy and somebody's sad. And processor one asks again, and now you'd send an invalidation request. And again, you can tell processor zero to send the processor one directly, uh, the data to processor one directly. Now they're both happy. But this is one way of handling it. Basically, there could be race conditions. You can uh, fix the race conditions by knacking negatively acknowledging requests uh, to uh, nodes that want the data. Original requester at some point retries. Then the question becomes, when do they retry, right? So knacking is actually interesting, but there may be a lot of knacks if there's a lot of contention, right? Imagine, for example, uh, you're starting a parallel program. Everybody wants to get data from a shared task queue, right? Now you have a block that's extremely contended, right? I don't know, maybe you don't want to program things this way, but this is possible, right? Thousand processors want to access the same lock at the same time. Now the directory becomes a bottleneck. So sometimes directories actually are designed by queuing the request and granting in sequence. So buffering is actually a good idea in this case. And usually it's a combination of buffering and knacking because your buffer is not infinite sized. You have a request buffer. And whenever you run out of request buffers, you start knacking. Okay, so fairness becomes an issue which requester should be preferred in a conflict. Everything that we discussed in quality of service now becomes an issue in the directory also, right? Maybe it's not exactly the same, but it's still a fairness problem. And there are also other issues like uh, interconnect delivery order. Uh, for example, uh, this processor is 1,000 hops away from the directory. This processor is one hop away. You should be careful how you grant the request, right? Because if you keep knacking the, pro uh, the, the processor that's 1,000 hops away, it's going to take a long time for that processor, poor processor, to communicate its request to you back again, right? So you're really penalizing that far away processor a lot if you keep knacking its request a lot. So there could be fairness issues based on the distance from the directory as well. So that matters and how the interconnect behaves also matters. So it becomes a complicated problem. Fairness becomes actually a lot more complicated in a scalable multiprocessor. We've seen it in a simple way in the memory controller, but as you start scaling things up, it becomes uh, much more complicated. And again, ping-ponging this invalidation can be reduced with protocol optimizations. Clearly you can optimize your protocol to minimize the invalidations or you can do, clearly ping-ponging can be sold at the higher level also, better synchronization mechanisms at the higher level. I'm not going to talk about that since we said we're not going to, hopefully you've seen how to reduce ping pong in pro parallel programming classes. Is that correct? Not as much? Okay, maybe you didn't go into this level of detail into hardware and parallel programming. But this is, I mean, if you read, for example, that Color and Sing book, they talk about this and I would recommend reading that book. We don't have time, but there's certainly a very interesting interaction between higher level synchronization constructs that you use in your program 
and the ping-ponging that happens in the lower level taxes, right? Maybe, uh, yeah, we don't have time, sorry. <laughs> I'd recommend reading some of these papers. Okay, let's talk about this and then we're gonna uh, take a break. Uh, sorry, it's a late break, but uh, we'll take it. So basically, the question now becomes how large is the directory, right? Some questions, let's take a look at this. How can we reduce the access latency to the directory? How can we scale the system to thousands of nodes? And can we get the best of snooping and directory protocols? I will not have all the answers, but these are actually good questions to ask. So heterogeneity is actually a good idea in the system. And there's one work that I would recommend. We don't have time to cover. This is a recent, well, relatively recent work in the works of coherence. It's called token coherence. And basically the idea is you have tokens associated with a cache block. And uh, uh, in order to be able to read, you need one token. In order to be able to write to the cache block, you need to have all the tokens in the system. And this sort of token-based cache coherence enables you to uh, scale things much better, basically. So somehow now you need to communicate the tokens and you can reason about correctness and performance in different ways. Uh, you can basically decouple the performance and correctness trade-offs. And I really like this paper, but we don't have time to talk about it. If you search for token coherence, it's got 2003. It's by Milo Martin, Mark Hill and others. Okay, so let's take a look at one example question. I'd like to use this example question. This is actually one of the, uh, I don't know, one of the exam questions, I think at some point. Assume we have a processor that implements a directory-based cache coherence protocol we discussed in class. The physical address space of the processor is 32 gigabytes and the cache block is 128 bytes. The directory is equally distributed across randomly selected 32 nodes in the system. You find out that the directory size in each of the 32 nodes is a total of 200 megabytes. First of all, that's a lot, right? 200 megabytes. Then the question is reverse engineering. How many total processors are there in the system, right? So, okay. So basically, what, if, what are we given? We have 32 gigabytes. Uh, that's the physical address space of the multiprocessor. Cache block is under 28 bytes. And the directory is distributed across 32 nodes. And total directory size, wait, directory size in each of the nodes. So each, uh, the directory size in each node is 200 megabytes. So we can easily calculate blocks per node, right? Basically, you have 32 gigabyte address space. Uh, and this is the number of blocks you have. It's, it's divided by 128 byte blocks. And it's distributed across 32 nodes. So each node should host two to the 23 blocks, right? So that's easy. Now we know the directory storage per node, 200 megabytes. And we know that there are two to the 23 uh, blocks per node, which means that, uh, well, I, I, I think I didn't really uh, show that calculation, but basically I expressed uh, 200 megabytes in terms of two to the 23 bytes over here, right? Okay, but directory storage per block, uh, is uh, this number over here. Yeah, to the, uh, to basically, uh, this is the directory storage, 200 megabytes expressed this way, divided by, uh, okay, let me go back. Directory storage per node, we know this, right? 200 megabytes. So ignore this calculation over here, but basically what we're going to do is divide 200 megabytes over here with the number of blocks that we found over here. That's the idea. And essentially you get 200 bit per block. This is just an expansion of 200 megabytes, which is not necessarily needed over here. It's just confusing, but it makes it easier to perhaps calculate in some way. And you know that each directory entry has P plus one bits. So which means that P must be equal to 199, right? So I have 199 processors in this case. So this is a small system, 199 processors. Even then it requires a lot of directory storage, right? So what is the total directory storage? 32 times 200 megabytes. That's a lot, right? That's on the order of six gigabytes, let's say, 6.4 gigabytes. Okay, that doesn't sound good. Okay, I think this is where I'll stop. <laughs> so this is uh, to think about basically. Well, how would you scale up the directory size? And this is a problem, this is a real problem. One way to scale up to, is to reduce the P plus one, right? Uh, do more compressed representations. But again, you need to have this information at some point. So if the number P grows, then whatever you store in each directory entry still needs to grow. Right? And you cannot really say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna allow only five shares. Actually, you can do that. That's another way, right? You can basically say, I'm gonna allow only N shares. And if somebody else wants to block, I'm gonna take out one of the shares, right? That way you don't need to keep track of 
all potential nodes as shares. That's a possibility, certainly. But now you're limiting the sharing capability of your system just so that you can design a better direct or, or simpler directory. Right. Yes, you have a question. Wouldn't it make sense to just store in the directory and what each cache block per process stores? Then we only have like a, a directory in the size of the total cache amount, not in the size of the total memory amount, or would that be too slow? Yeah, that could be too slow also, right? Now you need to communicate everything yeah, to the directory. I mean, that's, that's possible. At some point, the trade-off may be good, right? It depends on the size of the cache, the size of your private caches as well, right? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought, right? You, you can, yeah. <laughs> yes. Could you say it again? I couldn't hear. Yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> Instead of using the blocks, couldn't we use the cache lines to, to do that? Well, cache line is the same as cache block. Maybe yeah, I but there is multiple cache blocks in a cache line. Okay, what are you suggesting? You have cache blocks in the cache, and directory stores what? Uh, the cache line uh, address. So basically, it would reduce uh, the... Um, so every single... Oh, how can I say this? Um, so basically, no, the directory stores uh, every single... Uh, cache block that has um, a specific address, mm -hmm. right? And couldn't we, instead of using the cache blocks, use the cache lines in okay, the directory? Maybe I don't understand that because they're, they're, uh, I, I use them interchangeably, cache block and cache line. Are you suggesting that uh, something similar to your colleague here, which is you just communicate what the cache stores as opposed to keeping track of every potential cache block in the system? That could be, uh, that's what you were suggesting, right? Every cache communicates what it stores uh, and you don't have, yeah. I mean, that, that could also be difficult also. Right? Okay, maybe I'll let you think about it a little bit. Sure, that's fine. Okay, but this is a real problem basically. And then there's a problem of uh, the latency of the directory is long. Should you really cache the directory somewhere? And that's also possible. Uh, and you can also store some of the directory inside the memory itself. That's also possible some of the main memory for the directory storage that's also done in some systems because it's so large. It's similar to storing the tag store inside the memory, right? We discussed at some point, these ideas have similarities, but there's no way of easily getting around this basically. You, your, 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 your cost blows up in the end. And that's the beauty of Snoopy coherence mechanisms, right? If you have Snoopy coherence mechanisms, actually one way of reducing the cost is really dividing your entire multiprocessor into regions. You have this region of memory, every region of multiprocessor, you treat that as your region. And that region internally manages coherence, let's say, uh, in some other way, meaning it could be bus based. But you still need to get permission for that entire region from the directory. So the directory doesn't, directory knows about the regions of the processor, it doesn't know about the individual nodes. Does that make sense? That basically coarsens the granularity at which the directory needs to keep track of where a block is. So this sort of hierarchy enables better scaling in general. Okay, so let's uh, take a break. I'm going to take a 10 minute break today. So let's be back at 3.20 and then we will cover some recent research actually in cache coherence. You mean this example? Let's go back to it. Uh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Or no? Well, uh, no. Each node. So every node can access any part of memory, but the directory is distributed across thirty-two oh, nodes. Directory? Yeah. Huh. How would, how would even, oh, <laughs> as in like you have a central directory, uh -huh. and then you, you partition it into thirty-two. 
Okay. You so yeah, you're basically you partition your address space into 32. This part of the address space, if you want to get access to that part of the address space, you should go to this node that houses that directory. Uh, oh. That that basically contains permissions for that part of the address space. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Sure. Uh, I was thinking yeah. of something for the, the Snoopy cache and uh -huh. directory-based protocols. Uh -huh. So uh, I think uh, the best advantage of the Snoopy cache uh, protocol is that. Uh, Caches don't have to communicate between each other to exactly. tell each other what their states are. Uh -huh. uh, but the advantage of directory-based protocol is that uh, you can just you can just send blocks around between mm -hmm. caches instead of sure. uh, invalidating, telling everybody and everything else. Mm -hmm. So what I was thinking is maybe we go for something that's a hybrid of both of those, mm -hmm. where we use Snoopy cache uh, uh -huh. at the beginning. At, at the let's just say we have two levels where uh -huh. one level is. Uh, letting the caches know what their states are, uh -huh. and we use Snoopy cache for that. Uh, this, this protocol is Snoopy cache where they are all connected to. Uh, they snoop on each other's requests, uh -huh. and they get to know what each of their states are. But then we also let each of those uh, caches. Uh, we have a, a table, the directory. We uh -huh. store for uh, x n copies of the directory for each processor. Uh -huh. and each processor stores a clone of the directory with itself. Uh -huh. So now we've eradicated the need for the processor to go to a central directory and then put something. Uh -huh. And then now, whenever a processor has to grab a cache block, it can immediately look into its own directory, uh -huh. and then immediate. And then we also link the processor caches uh, between themselves uh -huh. using internal cache mine. Okay. And then now each processor can just look at its own directory, and then immediately go grab the cache block out of whoever has it. So what what is contained in each processor's directory? Uh, simply the information of uh, where each cache block is located. Uh, the, each cache block that it has its own cache. Uh, or I think we could also uh, uh -huh. just have for every block. Uh -huh. For every okay. block, we store a uh, algorithm of number of uh, uh -huh. processors. Okay, yeah. Plus one bits, uh -huh. which states uh, uh, whether a, ca a block uh -huh. is, in, is in one of those caches or it's in memory. Okay. Then uh -huh. directly look at the cache and then you directly look through it from the processor or uh -huh. the memory if it is in the processor. Okay. Which you store in the Okay. Yeah, basically you're 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 basically giving a local directory, right? Yeah. So you have a local directory, but still the storage is storage is high. Yeah. High, right? Okay. Okay. High, okay. Uh, we don't have contention uh -huh. uh, for letting everybody know what the state of the cache. That's true. Yeah. 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 And then uh, we are also eliminating the invalidation contention uh -huh. because each cache can simply invalidate its own block mm -hmm. as soon as it sees a read in the while well, snooping. Uh -huh. Everybody is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sort of hybrid could be. Better, but the storage cost can be very storage high cost. in this case, right? Because now you're replicating, replicating. directory everywhere almost, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, sure. Yeah, I think those sort of hybrids are actually what's being used yeah. in industry. Okay. And storage cost is usually a problem. Uh, do we have any information on uh, what the state of the yeah. is? Yeah, in, in general, no, industry doesn't like talking about these things because <laughs> this is actually also a good, a good place where there are a lot of bugs that exist. Uh -huh. So if you look at the errata of processors, a lot of the bugs are coherence <laughs> protocol bugs because it's easy to make is to, easy to get it wrong actually. The uh, like corner cases, of course, it's not the major cases, but the corner cases are hard to get it uh, get it completely correct. Uh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, the, they usually we know that it's a version of Moiesi, the directory based, and in a smaller re smaller regions they can do some bus based optimizations like what you have discussed. But they don't go into exact details of how it's done. Exactly, yeah. Sure. You're welcome. Did you have a question or? Um, two short questions. Firstly, about the weak uh, consistency uh -huh. model. Um, so, if I understood it correctly. It basically just means that you have like sections, which like the sections that aren't important, like the order isn't important. Uh -huh. They're characterized by these. Exactly. Yeah. And then every other section is like split. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, these arrows are the ones that where the order is important. Yeah, the ones yeah. where otherwise you'd have this. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Those are these areas where you can have this where you don't care about. Exactly. This. Exactly. Yeah. And then exactly what do these A and Bs mean? Like, if you need a release and acquire. Oh, basically, these are different locks. Let's say A is acquire lock A, mm -hmm. and B is acquire lock B. So it's a, it's a critical section. Okay, so it's just yeah. to illustrate that, like. From here to here, this has to happen, but what happens inside of it, the order doesn't happen. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. All right, okay. Sure. And otherwise, for the, um, what exactly like is the advantage of allowing back 
uh, cache write backs uh -huh. if you need to synchronize with the main memory anyway. At least that's the impression I got. Like when you implement uh -huh. directory with MS, with Messy, for example, uh -huh. you still need to ensure when you do like an extensive access request that the uh -huh. directory also has a version, like a, the latest version of it. Uh, not always. Uh, um, I mean, when you, uh, so uh, you can get an exclusive access. And once you have the exclusive access, you don't need to tell anyone about what you're doing. In that case, you can just have a direct transfer of the block from one block to the other. To the other. And then that processor who has the cache block as exclusive can do anything to the block without telling anyone, including the directory. It can keep writing, reading, writing, reading, writing, reading. Okay. Until somebody else needs the block, basically. All right. That's the advantage, basically. And the you need the, uh, the Snoopy with the uh, right the one that enables you to use write backs to write through. Uh -huh. so the, the MESI like protocol. Uh -huh. In that case, do you also have to go through the, the main memory when you transfer a block, or can you also directly go between caches? caches? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can still go directly between caches. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. there are advantages over the basic protocol. You never have to go through the memory again. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that's the exclusive state. That's the beauty of the exclusive state. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. All right.
I'm, I'm even muted. Okay, maybe people who are following on Zoom are not very happy, I guess. <laughs> okay, and nobody said anything. Maybe they're not really following, they're sleeping. <laughs> well, uh, the, okay, low battery. There's another issue here. <laughs> Everything comes at the same time. I have my battery this time. Yeah. I, I, is it easy to? Okay, why don't you give, <laughs> give it to me then? <laughs> It's better for your battery also not to keep it charged like that. <laughs> okay, I think we need to do it over here. I hope it'll work. Okay, it worked kind of. Okay, I'm going to repeat what I said because is there anyone on the on Zoom following us? Are you guys sleeping? Okay, we can tell they're sleeping right now. Okay, this thing is annoying. It doesn't Let me do this. Ah. Oh. Okay, I do this now, and then this, and then finally we move this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, basically we're going to cover a recent example. I'll go through this relatively quickly. And we have these near data accelerators. How do you provide coherence between the near data accelerator and processor, let's say? And the issue is, uh, the bandwidth uh, here, the link between CPU and DRAM is already constrained. And if you keep adding coherence messages here, then you have another problem, basically. You need to be basically very frugal in terms of coherence messages. You cannot keep adding, sending a lot of invalidations, for example. So that's the challenge, basically. There's a large cost of off-chip communication to begin with. You want to waste it on coherence messages. And near data uh, accelerating uh, applications generate large amount of off-chip data movements. So if you actually have to get permissions for every single cache block, how much would that impact performance? I'm gonna give you some analysis for MESI protocol, for example. It's not gonna be that good. Basically, it's impractical to use traditional coherence protocols. Maybe impractical is a strong word, but it basically loses a lot of the advantage of near data processing if you use traditional coherence protocols. Let's take a look at some examples. So this paper extensively studies existing near data accelerator coherence mechanisms and basically makes three key observations. First of all, they eliminate a significant portion of uh, in-memory processing benefits. In fact, in some cases, you were perform worse than if you were just using the CPU. Probably not a good idea. And the majority of the off-chip coherence traffic generated by these coherence mechanisms are not necessary. And much of the off-chip traffic can be eliminated if the coherence mechanism uh, has insight into what's happening in the memory access, meaning it basically takes a more coarser grain view of what's happening. And basically it's more optimistic as we will see. So we're gonna take an optimistic approach. So there, there are different approaches to concurrency. Optimistic approach says there are optimistic concurrency and pessimistic concurrency. Pessimistic concurrency says, I don't have permission to access this block unless I get it. So I don't want to access this block unless I get the permission. What does this mean? This means that basically I'm not gonna do anything to the block until I get the permission, which means that permission is on the critical path. Optimistic concurrency says, I'm gonna assume that I have permission to this block. And if I later find out that I didn't have permission, I'm gonna roll back and do the same thing again. So optimistic concurrency is by nature speculative, right? It's basically speculatively assuming that it's going to get permissions to the block and then it's going to roll back. Which means that while you're doing this optimistic execution that's speculative, you need to keep track of what you've done and you need to keep track of what others have done and you need to make sure that there's nothing wrong semantically in what was done during that optimistic execution. Right? So this is a very old idea. It was developed in late 1970s, for example, for databases. When you program databases, you do transactions, right? And they basically ran into the same issues. Should I execute this transaction by getting all the permissions to the database tables to begin with? Or should I just optimistically assume I have permissions and keep track of what I did? So you can implement this purely in software, basically. It doesn't have to have any hardware support. But of course, in software, uh, you can have other overheads because you need to keep track of what you've done, right? So that's the idea of optimistic versus pessimistic concurrency. And we're going to exploit the optimistic concurrency here because pessimistic 
adds more delays uh, in the end. So transactional memory is an example of optimistic concurrency. Actually. How many people know about transactional memory? Okay, some people do, some people don't. Let me give a quick example. Because what we're going to look at is kind of transactional memory, except for the programmer doesn't do it. Well, I guess kind of programmer doesn't do it also. Okay, I'm waiting for Zoom to provide me with the panel. It's not doing that. Okay, I guess now it does, it did it. So let's go back to this, share screen. Ah, advanced. Okay, is that better? Not yet. Okay, so basically, I mean, uh, at a high level, transactional memory, this is our lock-based programming, right? You do lock A, acquire A, and then you have the critical section, and then unlock A. And then you may actually uh, do another lock B over here, potentially internally, and have another critical section inside here, right? Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, and then basically this could be a nested lock, right? So you can have nested critical sections. And basically the realization is that these lock -based, this lock-based programming is not easy for programmers because you run into a lot of issues, right? Potentially deadlocks, live locks, uh, lock convoying, meaning uh, you have a lot of waiting on the locks. So synchronization is not easy for programmers. So why not have another approach? Get, free the programmer of locks, meaning just have the notion of this, begin transaction, and then this is some transactional code, PX code, and then end transaction. And this sort of execution provides you with isolation, basically. No one else, while you're doing this transaction, I guess I should say atomicity and isolation, the illusion that you give to the programmer is you, once you start a transaction, you either execute it all or you execute none, right? And this enables you to actually get rid of the locks. Actually, all of them you can get rid of with transactions. And that way you can reason about your program much better right now, right? You can basically write the right transactional code. It's atomic, meaning it's executed all or none. And it's isolated, meaning that if there's some conflict, if there's someone else who is writing to a block this transaction is reading from, or vice versa, that conflict uh, gets handled in such a way that uh, you don't get wrong results. Does that make sense? So basically, you're protecting the shared data with transactions as opposed to with locks, individual locks that you need to do. And now the system is protecting the data, right? You don't have locks like this. Whenever you say the transaction, either you executed all or you executed none. If there's a data conflict while you're executing the transaction, if there's another data conflict with some other transaction, the system guarantees that, first of all, uh, only one transaction finishes if there's a data conflict and there's no correctness issue. So how does the system guarantee that? Well, the system needs to keep track of what happens in the transaction, right? What is the transaction reading? What are the blocks it's reading? What are the blocks it's writing? So read sets, write sets, and then compares these read sets and write sets to some other transaction or some other code that's executing transactionally also. It could be completely different code, right? So basically different processes can, different threads can be executing different transactions. Well, there's no different transaction. There's a transaction, right? This code needs to be executed atomically. The guarantee that the system provides us, if these transactions for some reason conflict, meaning one of them reads something that the other writes, and uh, or both they both write to the same location and are in irresolvable order, let's say, then uh, the system guarantees this atomicity as well as isolation. That's the idea, basically. Of course, now this, the complexity goes into the system, right? This is the this is where the programmer has the complexity. This is where the system has the complexity. So who's, who does this? So people uh, have developed methods for doing this in com completely in software. It's called software transactional memory. People develop methods to do it completely in hardware and people develop methods to actually do it cooperatively. So 
cooperatively means, uh, well, well, software means, uh, software keeps track of the read set and write set and making sure that transactions uh, commit and uh, restart uh, correctly. Uh, doing it in hardware says that hardware keeps track of this read set and write set. Right? And people have shown that hardware transactional memory is actually a much higher performance than software transactional memory. By the way, in the, uh, at the beginning, it was developed in hardware. The initial uh, transactional memory proposals were in hardware. Okay, any questions? Yes. Uh, conceptually, I'm not, I'm not very clear on the difference between transactional memory and sequential consistency. Wouldn't sequential consistency achieve the same result as transactional memory at the end? Well, this is a higher level construct, right? This, is, this, this says nothing about the ordering of requests. This is basically saying this piece of code should be executed atomically. That's the only thing it's saying, right? If you think about sequential consistency, it's about ordering of operations. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have any bearing on how the piece of code should be executed. Yeah. Yes. So how does this deal with, um, like you mentioned that if during one uh, well, part, like one, uh, another one is also uh, like conflicting, uh -huh. how does it, one of them and then restart it later so and people have developed a lot of policies to handle it in a nice way because there are a lot of issues performance fairness etc right but yes usually if there's a data conflict you you kill one of the transaction meaning roll back the state of the processor to the beginning and then you keep hopefully you finish the other transaction right but again this has issues right if i mean one way of writing your parallel program this way is you have the thread you start the thread by saying begin transaction and you end the thread by saying end transaction. So everything you do in a thread is a transaction, right? That doesn't sound very good because the probability of conflicts potentially increases that way, right? So it's still a good idea to keep your transactions smaller if you want to reduce the probability of conflicts. But now you don't need to think about the locks. You just need to reason about your code uh, such that do I, should I execute this piece of code atomically and share data updates the answer is yes, right? If you're updating shared data, uh, that atomicity helps, right? Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I should not switch the camera, but I should stop sharing. So basically what we're going to discuss is going to be a similar approach. I'm gonna actually give you a little bit more implementation uh, details over here, but this is an example of optimistic concurrency. Optimistic concurrency, well, okay, maybe I should go back to the advanced thing over here. So why is an example of optimistic concurrency? Because multiple processes can be in the transaction, different transactions at any point in time, right? In fact, all, all, all cores, all threads may be in the different transactions. Whereas locking is pessimistic, right? You wait until you get the lock so that you can go into the critical section. So basically transaction is fundamentally speculative. You're speculating, whereas here, unless your processor underneath is speculating, you're not speculating. Your model is not, uh, at least your software model is not speculative over here. Okay. So now I definitely want to go back. Huh? Okay. So basically we're gonna take a similar optimistic approach. Uh, so this optimistic approach enables you to explore what happens in the program also, right? Before any coherence checks happen. And you, you can perform only the necessary coherence checks uh, at the end of a transaction, basically. Okay, I think, uh, basically you avoid unnecessary coherence requests. I'll go through this uh, with, with an example. And it turns out you can come within 10% and 4% of the performance energy of an ideal coherence mechanism. Ideal coherence mechanism means that you don't have any overhead for coherence, right? You still maintain coherence, but magically it comes with no overhead. Ideally, that's what you want. You, you want that ideal. Okay, so let's talk about, well, you know about near data processing, so I'm gonna go through this very quickly. We've covered this a lot. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some, how some applications behave. Basically, uh, we've discussed this also in earlier lectures, but not all portions of applications benefit from near data processing clearly. Some, uh, some parts, uh, benefit a lot from near data processing. Some parts are compute intensive or cache friendly and they should remain on the CPU. So it actually makes sense to partition your program 
such that part of it executes on the CPU, part of it executes on the near data processor, right? So this is certainly similar to how you partition your parallel program, but now you're, you have another uh, constraint, which is uh, what benefits from near data acceleration. So, and it turns out CPU threads, the, the threads that are executing on the CPU, often concurrently access the same region of data that near uh, threads that are executing on near data engines. They're called kernels in this paper. So there's, there's significant data sharing that can happen depending on your, how you partition your program. Ideally, you would partition it so that you will eliminate that data sharing, but in some cases that is not possible because you have some data intensive portions that operate on the data and compute intensive portions do want to do something else on the data. Right? And it turns out uh, they don't concurrently access the same, the same cache signs typically. They may access similar regions of code, but they don't necessarily access the same cache size depending on how you do the partitioning. So this is some empirical data for some partitioning, for some graph processing application. Let's say only 5% of the CPU accesses collide with NDA accesses. I would say this is not small, but it's also not large, right? 5%. So basically CPU threads rarely update the same data that an NDA uh, is actively working on. Again, this is dependent on the application and the papers, a lot of application analysis that I'm ignoring over here. But now let's take a look at the coherence mechanisms given some applications. So let's take a look at three coherence mechanisms. Non-cacheable is one thing that we discussed, right? Mark the, uh, mark the data that the processing in memory engine is operating on as non-cacheable. And then the en uh, processing engine operates on it. Uh, and then if the CPU needs it, it basically cannot utilize the caches. Right? Doesn't sound good for the CPU. Coarse grain coherence is get coherence permission for the entire region of data that the near data processing engine is operating on. And the fine grain coherence is essentially a MESI protocol, for example. So let's take a look at the non-cacheable approach. You mark the data that the processing in memory engine operates on as non-cacheable. So this is an application that's actually quite interesting. It's a hybrid transactional analytical database. You have a database and the data, database basically gets different sort of uh, things that you do different sort of things in the database, right? One is analytical queries and the others are transactional queries. Transactional queries are like bank transactions, for example. You need to update a, a bank account, for example. Analytical queries is maybe you go through the database and you, you basically find out some information about bank accounts, but you don't necessarily update them. Analytical queries are usually scans, basically. You're scanning through large amounts of data and you're trying to find something. You're trying to, you're, you're basically trying to do some analytics on large amounts of data. Whereas transactions are more targeted. You pick, let's say a couple of bank accounts and you do something on them, right? So these are actually quite different characteristics, it turns out. Analytical queries are actually better fit for uh, near data acceleration because again, they're consuming, uh, they, uh, they're accessing a lot of data and they're doing usually simple operations on the data. In fact, uh, the, uh, the things that we have seen uh, in earlier lectures, processing using memory approaches, MBIT, for example, a lot of the benefits come from these scan operations. You actually, the, the column accesses, for example, you're searching some, for something in the database and you're doing a lot of bitwise accesses, for example, to understand, uh, basically you're looking for uh, some things in the database and those bitwise accesses happen a lot in the analytical queries like this. Transactional queries are usually compute intensive actually, because you're not accessing a lot of data, you're accessing a specific, piece of your database. I mean, it could be large depending on the data structure, of course, but you're not scanning through a huge number of entries, let's say. And uh, your goal is to uh, really do a specific operation over here. And it turns out these are better fit in general. These are, this is a generalization, of course. In general, transactional queries are a better fit because they're more compute bound, whereas analytical queries are better fit for uh, NDA because they're more memory bound. Now this leads to data sharing. You may be scanning through some things and this transaction may be updating some things, right? And if there's a conflict, you cannot, do, you cannot afford to do something wrong. Okay, I think I've kind of said it. Uh, these transactional queries generates a large number of off-chip accesses and uh, they hurt CPU performance. Uh, well, uh, well, the reason, if you, if you take an uncacheable approach, basically. Basically, transactional queries actually take advantage of caches really well. If you say, my approach to near data acceleration will be non-cacheable. CPU cannot benefit from its caches. That doesn't sound very good, right? So it turns out if you take this non-cacheable approach, uh, it, it doesn't provide any energy saving and performs 6% worse than CPU only. Basically, in-memory processing doesn't help you. 
coarse grain coherence, another example, you get coherence permission for the entire region of data that uh, processing in memory is processing. And for this to happen, whenever the processing in memory starts a kernel, you need to flush the dirty data belonging to that region into the near data, uh, into memory. So that's memory doesn't need to, uh, yeah, basically memory gets that permission right. Basically, it turns out this unnecessarily flushes large amount of dirty data, especially in applications that access a lot of data. And uh, you can use coarse grain locks. Uh, basically, in this case, you use coarse grain locks to provide exclusive access, right? So what, this, uh, what, what does this mean, basically? CPU flushes the data, near data accelerator has access to data. And whenever CPU wants to access this NDA data, because the transaction requires it, then it needs to stop because a lock, you, you have this, you can implement coarse grain coherence using locks, right? You're locking a huge amount of data. Uh, and well, it could be actually smaller amounts of data again, but whenever the CPU needs that data, you, it needs to stop. Okay, it, it turns out this is also not great solution because it's, it performs similar to a CPU only. If you define grain coherence, actually it's, it's good in terms of performance improvement. Uh, basically it simplifies the programming model because again, whatever you write on the memory side uh, is similar to a thread that you execute on the CPU, assuming both, of you, both use fine grain coherence. It allows uh, to get permissions for only the pieces of data that are going to be actually accessed. Right? You don't protect huge amounts of data or you don't, think, you don't uh, disable your caches. So, uh, okay, I'll go through this relatively quickly. Basically the downside of this is it, get, it leads to high amount of, of chip cache coherence traffic because now, Whatever you want to access over here, you need to get permission, right? There's some coherence mechanism. Let's say it's directory-based, bus-based. It doesn't matter again in this case. You need to get that permission by sending a message over this bus. Right? It turns out that actually fine-grained coherence is the best coherence mechanism still, but it eliminates significant fraction of the energy benefits of an ideal NDA mechanism. So let's take a look at the analysis. These are This is performance. Uh, energy is here. These are some workloads. Not all workloads are shown over here. Uh, 1.0 is a CPU only. Ideal NDA is there's no coherence overhead. And these are applications that are partitioned with small data sets. That's why the numbers are small, actually. I'll give you results with a large data sets at some point. But basically, if you don't have any coherence overheads, the performance improvement with near data processing is actually not bad, right? It goes, it's higher than 50% in all cases. If you use non cacheable coherence, as I said, it's not good. Uh, yeah. If you use coarse grain, again, it's not good. If you use fine grain, actually, you get some of the benefits of ideal NDA. But if you look at the energy benefits, uh, if you look at the energy benefits, uh, there's some energy benefit with coarse grain and fine grain. But again, non cacheable is another good idea, as you can see over here. But basically, the takeaway is that if you don't have a coherence mechanism that's kind of designed uh, with, let's say, frugality in mind, because these all are transferring a lot of data or causing other issues. Uh, then you don't get close to the ideal coherence mechanism. Okay, there's more data over here that you can read basically. We already discussed some of these. Okay, so basically uh, that's, the goal. that's the problem here. You have this near data accelerator that's powerful, but because you're not handling coherence well, it's, its benefits are eliminated. And it turns out the majority of the off-chip coherence is actually unnecessary off-chip coherence traffic. And we would like to design a coherence mechanism that retains the benefits of ideal near data acceleration and enforce coherence with only the necessary data mode as much as possible. That's the frugality part. Let's take a look at this optimistic model. It's going to be similar to what I showed you earlier, uh, but it's going to be somewhat imbalanced uh, uh, to, for the memory side. Okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly because we already said this. So we're gonna use optimistic execution for near data accelerates. And why does it make sense to use optimistic execution? Because you have this low rate of collision, low rate of conflict between the data uh, uh, that's processed by the CPU and uh, in-memory processing. So NDA executes the kernel, assumes that it has coherence permissions, and it basically keeps track of what it does. And when execution is done, it performs only the necessary coherence requests. It's very similar to kind of what I showed you over here. I didn't show you exactly what do you, uh, what do you do at the end of the execution. So we're gonna take a look at that. So let's take a look at the high level overview. So CPU executes the thread. At some point it launches a kernel on the memory side. And this executes optimistically, 
meaning it doesn't require any permissions. It doesn't ask for permission. It just keeps executing. So this is concurrent. There's no coherence request that's sent. At the end, you resolve the coherence in a block manner. So what does block manner mean? You look at everything that you have done over here. You look at everything that was done over here and see if it has conflicted. So, and if, if, if the coherence is resolved fine, there's no problem, then you commit the result. So this requires buffering of the results also. So what I didn't mention is transactional memory requires a lot of buffering of the results. So you don't want to update the memory before you know that you should really update the memory. Right? Because it's all or none, right? At the end, and, and here the optimistic execution is all or none. Here, this is not optimistic over here, basically. This is, you keep doing it. There's no transaction on the side. That's the difference here. Here we have optimistic execution and it's all or none. Meaning, uh, if optimistic execution fails, you should not have updated any state, any architectural state, right? If optimistic execution works, then you should update the architectural state at that point. Transactional memory is very similar. You need to buffer all of those updates and do them at the end. And that becomes a bottleneck sometimes actually in transactional memory, but you can read the papers related to that. So that's the high level overview basically. It's a mechanism that uses optimistic execution to avoid unnecessary traffic. So how do you actually do uh, the checking? You need to have signatures at the end. And these signatures keep track of what you have read over here and what you have written to. And you also keep track of what the CPU has read and written to, and then you compare them. So there needs to be some signature resolution. You send the signatures at the end of execution of the processing in memory kernel. And these signatures get compared to at the CPU. And the CPU says, okay, optimistic execution was fine. It basically says, we finish what you're doing, update your memory. Or it says, there's something wrong, go back to the beginning and re-execute. Of course, go back to the beginning, re-execute may not work very well unless the CPU actually flushes some of the blocks that is added into caches, right? And it can actually figure out what to flush if it has address information over here. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but that's the idea. Maybe I'll show you some pictures. Okay, so how do you identify these coherence violations? So coherence requests are only necessary if both the near data extract and the CPU access a cache line, at least one of them updates it. But even then, not everything is necessary because you can actually think of reordering the request element. So let's take a look at three possible interleaving accesses to the same cache block, cache line. And only one of them causes coherence violation, actually. I'm going to give you examples of the first two, and you can reason about the last one. Uh, Let's take a look at the first. So the first one is uh, near data extractor reads and the CPU writes to a location. So this is near data extractor is doing optimistic execution over here. CPU writes to Z, near data extractor reads from Z. And this leads to a coherence violation, right? Because you don't do any coherence checks during NDA execution. At the end, you need to check. And you find out that near data extractor actually read the old value of Z, right? So you flush. Z to the run. That makes sense, right? Okay. Here, this is an interesting case, basically. Uh, the near data accelerator uh, writes to Y. CPU also writes to Y. Uh, here, there is no coherence violation, actually. Basically, coherence check happened at the end of the kernel. Let's say it's here. Here, C4 and C5 looks like they've happened before. This happened. So assuming your model actually allows this, and there's some programming model on top of this that I'm not going to discuss, then you don't need to check for this coherence. Because C4 and C5, write to Y and read to Y, happened before near data accelerator committed all of its data. Does that make sense? So you can actually optimize these things. OK, so you can basically commit in this case. So this is another example of being frugal, right? You could easily declare that, okay, you did something wrong over here, but if the ordering of operations allow this, then there's no problem. This is where coherence and consistency may come into play, right? Basically, this is, uh, there's a semantic ordering of requests. If, if, if these definitely have to be ordered before this, then there's a problem. Uh, uh, like uh, so in, a, in an interleaved manner, then there's a problem, but then you need to have some synchronization between them also. Okay, so let's talk about the architecture support relatively quickly. Uh, basically, you need to have these read sets and write sets that I mentioned. Uh, 
And here we're assuming that near data accelerator has an L1 cache, just like the Tesseract ideas that we discussed earlier. Uh, this is like a near memory processor, not uh, processing using memory. But you can imagine that also potentially. It requires some more thinking. Uh, and then CPU also has a write set over here. And then a coherence resolution engine. Okay, let's go through this quickly. And there's some, uh, basically you cannot commit the request to memory. So there's, a, uh, there's some additional metadata that you need to keep saying that these requests are speculative, right? Actually, all transactional memory mechanisms require that as well. Uh, you cannot, uh, until you know that you're going to commit this transaction, you cannot commit the updates to memory. So you need to mark the cache block speculative, the updated. And uh, if the transaction commits, you commit the speculatively updated blocks to memory and then mark them as updated now. If the transaction aborts, meaning it needs to roll back, you basically invalidate all of those speculatively updated blocks. That's the idea, basically. And all, again, all transactional memory mechanisms have this issue. And we've discussed these read sets and write sets. And clearly, the, these read sets and write sets are used to track memory accesses from here. And this write set is used to keep, the, used to keep track of write accesses over here. So then you need to do a signature comparison, right? At the end, so how do you build the signature? I'm not going to go through the details of it, but you can, you can have bloom filters again to build the signature. And that makes the signature simpler. And that's this, this is what the paper does. And paper actually looks at the sensitivity to bloom filters, et cetera. Bloom filters are a beautiful structure. Uh, so it makes it easy to perform this coherence resolution uh, by doing operations on the bloom filters. And yeah, you can, you can enable again storage of large number of addresses. Of course, if your NDA kernel is very large, your bloom filter can get uh, a lot of set bits, right? So it's, it makes sense to keep your uh, NDA kernel small as well. Okay. Okay, so how do you detect a conflict? Basically, you do a comparison between the read set and the write set. If there are no conflicts, any clean cache signs on the CPU that match an address in the NDA write set are invalidated and uh, NDA commits the data updates. So you need to still keep, uh, basically you're enforcing coherence at the end of the execution, right? And if the conflict happens though, then the CPU flushes the dirty cache signs that match the address in the NDA read set, because these are things that NDA read, but CPU wrote. So you need to flush the new values so that the NDA kernel, when it restarts, gets the right values. Right? And NDA invalidates all uncommitted cache lines, as I said, because they're, they're stored in the L1 cache. Right? And the signatures are erased and NDA restarts execution. Hopefully that makes sense, right? This is the mechanics. Of course, the quest, there, are, there are questions like, how do you find out what are the dirty cache lines, et cetera? These could be accelerated with additional data structures. So you need to keep some data structures for those. So let's take a look at the evaluation. So this is, again, simulation-based evaluation. These are the applications. There are some graph processing applications and hybrid databases. Again, you can read these slides on your own if you're interested. And these are the results. And the results look reasonably good. Uh, I think these are results we already discussed. Uh, I already discussed that also. But basically, the prior mechanisms are not that good in terms of performance. And if you look at Conda, it gets close to the ideal NDA. There's still a gap, as you can see. It's not perfect, but it gets close. So there's some performance loss because of rollbacks, uh, because of the additional overhead of coherence communication, et cetera, because ideal NDA assumes that there is no communication for coherence. Magically, coherence happens, and there's no rollback, clearly, in that case also. So there's still room, for, room to improve, as you can see. But you get close to the ideal. And energy benefits are also similar. If you look at the energy, uh, Conda gets close to the ideal NDA's benefits, uh, perhaps even closer than it gets uh, in terms of performance. Well, now you, can, you can imagine why uh, fine-grained coherence is energy inefficient, because for every single cache block, you need to send a coherence request over the bus. OK, I already said that. So the paper has a lot of other information, but I'm not going to go through this in detail. So it turns out coherence becomes a bigger problem as the system scales, as expected. So we're looking at a more scaled system with, instead of having one CPU and one memory, one, one near data accelerator, if you have one CPU and four near data accelerators, right? Four stacks, for example, because your memory size also grows and 
You may want to do different things in different parts of memory. And coherence becomes a bigger problem. You can see that the ideal NDA is much uh, better than the baseline system as the number of stacks grows. And Conda is still better than before, but the distance between Conda and ideal NDA also grows, meaning that the efficiency of this mechanism also uh, is not, uh, doesn't scale as well with the number of stacks, let's say. So this, I think there's more to do in this area for sure. Well, one of the downsides of this mechanism is also complicated, right? You need to keep track of read sets, write sets, et cetera. In general, transactional memory is complicated. It's not simple. Uh, people have implemented transactional memory and uh, all of the processes that have implemented transactional memory had issues basically in transactional memory so far. Maybe IBM is a big uh, difference. IBM uh, in their processor, in their Z series, I think they implemented it. I don't think they have the bugs that the other, others have. Intel, for example, implemented it. They, uh, their implementation was fraught with bugs, let's say. Uh, but basically, this suffers from similar complexities as transactional memory in the end. Maybe there should be better solutions or simpler solutions to coherence for near data accelerators as well. So there are some other interesting results in the paper. So these results look, uh, so there are larger data sets, which are hard to simulate. But if you actually increase your data set size, uh, the performance improvements of near data processing actually grows significantly. And you get significantly better benefits from uh, coherence as well. And there are a bunch of sensitivity analyses and you can look at the hardware analysis as well. Okay, I think I, uh, I've covered everything. Let's see if there's anything interesting to say over here. Yeah, nothing really interesting because I've covered all of this. Any questions? Yes, please. Isn't there a risk of starvation of the NDA? Yes. <laughs> so basically, yes, certainly there's a risk of starvation, right? And uh, I mean, this paper doesn't cover those issues, but there's a lot of work actually in transactional memory in terms of how to handle that starvation. I mean, in the worst case, you say, you tell the CPU, CPU stop, right? I'm going to execute this NDA kernel. And, and a lot of the works in transactional memory actually I do that at some point. That's the worst case, basically. Only one thread executes, finishes the transaction, and you basically continue. <laughs> so there are ways of handling that problem. But that's a real issue with transactional memory also, actually. As, especially as the transaction sizes grow and people, uh, there are many transactions that are running concurrently, you may always be rolling back, basically, and never continuing. There's a forward progress issue. Yes? Why is there, I mean, some trans transactions always should make forward progress, shouldn't they? Or, or why is there a forward progress issue? Well, uh, because uh, one transaction may always keep rolling back, right? So some transactions may, yes, some transactions may make progress, sure. But if one of them is not making progress because you're unfair to it for some reason, uh, then you have the yeah, forward progress. Yeah. And then also probably you can construct cases where if you're, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think there, people have actually looked, at, looked a lot into this issue. Transaction scheduling, fairness, who should you, who should you roll back also? Uh, things like that, yeah. Okay, so if you're interested, you can read the paper also. And then we're done, I think. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, maybe you guys are thinking about simpler mechanisms right now. <laughs> because we do need some simpler mechanisms, I think, for coherence. I think that's been the difficulty. People, people were very good at coming up with more and more complicated mechanisms. No question about that, but it's an area where we need a lot simpler thinking going forward, perhaps. So that's, that could be a breakthrough in coherence, for example, if you come up with a very simple mechanism. That doesn't make the programmer crazy. Okay, then we're done. Next week, we're going to talk about interconnects, which is tightly coupled with multiprocessing. And uh, I guess I'll see you next week. Have a good, have a good weekend. Stay safe. Okay. Video.